Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show. This is episode number 722 with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 722 with I, your host, Agostino. Welcome back to the show. It's been a long time coming, been a coming, a long time pause and all that malarkey, as the kids are saying nowadays when you make any sort of sexual innuendo type of joke type of thing. But hey, we are here, we are here, we are here. It's been a bit of a roller coaster of a week, especially for those of you out there who support Man United. For those of you who don't care and love to, you know, laugh at my tears, you will be happy that I will be very tearful today because of some of the horrendous results that we've had this week and some of the false hope and the false dawns that have also happened. And just the eternal, eternal roller coaster that involves being a Man United fan. It's just never ending. It never seems to end. The ownership is nowhere near being sorted out partial ownership with Sir Jim Ratcliffe are the Qatari groups still involved we don't know we don't know and um, we've also got loads of information to talk about in terms of some couple of shows I've been watching during the week and um, bits and bobs on fashion and whatnot and then of course other bits and bobs in terms of cultural news I want to share with you lovely people so if it's your first time you're enjoying the show you know sit back relax grab yourself a little drink and let's just dive on deep so first things first to mention just as a kind of you know a bit of a somber way to start the pod actually and not something that you probably would want to start pods with but i wanted to just acknowledge this because you know it's something that i've kind of been thinking about all week so i want to just say um on the pod to rip to joshua sweeney um the friend of mine who i've known for a very very long time but unfortunately in the last few years we hadn't really spoken much we kind of had a bit of a falling out which i don't know really what it was about to be honest it probably wasn't anything that was really um worth it in the long scheme of things but you know male pride gets in a way time kind of gets in between and then you know by the time you turn around things have changed and people have gone away and unfortunately he passed away at the beginning of the week and it's been something that has oddly enough had a weird effect on me i'd say in terms of just making me realize how important it is to you know cherish people while they're around that's the obviously number one thing um i don't think there's anything i probably could have changed in terms of our relationship in the interim that would have saved it or rectified it in any way shape or form um i think i've now got to the stage where especially when i used to have a tendency to try to rescue things like i'd be a type of person who'd be like going out you know swapping instagrams with people and stuff and thinking those people are your friends and you contact them the next day or you want to go out to another party with them and then suddenly you know they kind of leave you on scene or it's not the same sort of vibe and i think you slowly realize and again that's not the best example because those are usually you know crappy circumstances and you're usually drunk and high and stuff but i think what you realize is that sometimes it's probably better just to enjoy the moment for what it is um savor it live in it um center yourself in it and then just you know however it kind of plays out it plays out but don't try and force anything right don't try and chase anything usually it doesn't work that way especially in a city like london where there's so many people coming in and out people's careers are going up and down family structures change relationship structures change people are just always on the move it's really difficult to kind of hold on to people for the most part you really have to work um to really maintain or to nurture a relationship here or even a friendship in london i think for the most part maybe because it's transient maybe because londoners are a bit stush i don't really know but there's something that goes on there but regardless um you know when we were younger um a lot of us i think this this is probably my first sort of like friendship group outside of church when I used to go all the time. So these were my first sort of friends I used to hang out with and the, you know, the first people I kind of discovered Bape. I discovered Supreme with started to discover skateboarding with, buying hype sneakers, going out, you know, on our own as kind of young adults, all that sort of stuff we sort of like were doing together for the first time. And it was an important um, I would say valuable experience in that it kind of allowed us to all grow up at the same time. You know what I mean? Like um, most of us probably, I think with the exception, maybe a couple didn't really go to uni. Um, and the ones I did like myself, I went to a London one. So you didn't really have an opportunity to kind of go away and do the whole uni thing. And I remember kind of regretting that a lot, even though I went to a really good one in terms of St. Martin's. Um, I regretted the decision of like staying in London a lot. But one of the things that made it good or made it really great was meeting people like Josh and a few other people who basically were you able to sort of like you know grow up with them together kind of discover and experience things for the first time we all kind of went on our first lads 
kind of like young people's holiday to New York when we were all like 18, 19, 20 or something, which was a really formative experience. Well, no, it was really our formative years, but it was a really formative experience also. And just in general, man, we just had a whale of a time. We had such a good time together, um, going out all the time to like, you know, little private views, store openings, um, traveling around to the UK, places like Birmingham and whatnot, um, doing random house parties, um, you know, random sessions in other people's places as well, like just constantly being around each other all the time and it's unfortunate how like you know things change over time and it's never the same and usually those experiences don't really carry on relationships don't carry on a lot of people featuring these pictures aren't really even cool with each other anymore which is again super unfortunate but i think with his passing one thing i kind of realized was that you know we'd had a great time even though we didn't speak in the last few years of his life i think i will still cherish all those great memories you know um hanging around together around shoreditch and stuff going to out into old tree and whatnot and just generally just trying to like discover and experience things together for the first time i think all those things are super important especially for a young man like myself who probably didn't have the most um life experiences at that point where i was kind of sheltered i was kind of you know not allowed to go out a lot and to kind of discover the these kind of guys who are like you know literally latching key um latching key kids when i was the complete opposite was a really good thing and you know we we're able to all kind of just chill and enjoy each other's company a lot and i really did enjoy those years so um r.i.p to joshua sweeney thoughts and feelings go out to his family and friends um especially his family i know how close he was with them i can't even imagine what they're going through right now and yeah man just prayers and healing to everybody involved really and um, I guess the message on the end of this would just be like, you know, savor and, you know, really honor and respect your relationships and your friendships and stuff. And if there is a possibility to set, you know, to save something, to kind of, you know, remedy a situation, to make it maybe work, make it work, please do try and reach out first as you can, because I don't think, you know, maybe that was a ma major mistake that I made in terms of just letting it go and thinking, OK, we'll come back around. And it never did come back around because I kind of moved on my life and I guess he moved on. And then by the time you turn around, you know, it's too late to sort of rescue anything. So if you do have opportunity to save or something or you feel like doing it because that's also something that needs to be said then definitely do it but for some prayers guys everybody in his family and involved and yeah man hope they are doing well really i don't really know how well you can do in this type of situation it's flipping tragic to be fair because he was way too young to pass away um the way that he did so r.i.p to joshua sweeney and as a mark of remembrance i'm going to do a little one minute um you know remembrance of him and stuff so bear with me a second r.i.p joshua sweeney yeah unfortunate situation really unfortunate for all involved really 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 is but anyway let's move on from that one so next things to talk about here is this tv series i've been watching at the moment on netflix called blue eye samurai i'm not too sure if anybody of you checked it out and stuff and i know usually anime and animation stuff doesn't really you know it's a bit of a niche audience it's kind of marmite you're over in it or you're not in it uh you're over into it so you're not into it so it's kind of one of those recommendations that might fall flat for a few people but if you are looking for good storytelling, if you are looking for good character development, if you're looking for like a good, sharp, to the point, I think it's eight episode um, series, I really recommend you check it out. Some of the fight scenes in this um, anime, manga, animation, whatever you want to call it, is incredibly well done. Like it reminds me of like John Wick number one, I swear to God, in terms of how fun they are. I was rewinding mad segments 
of some of the fight scenes they're incredibly gory loads of blood um i also like that the protagonist in this the blue-eyed samurai gets injured quite often as well like it's not just a, like oh this person's running through brick walls and stuff you see them absolutely getting battered and bruised and flung all over the place and stuff and have to kind of you know stitch themselves up patch themselves up i really like that for aspects of it and in general just to give you a synopsis it follows this blue-eyed samurai um who is an outcast essentially this person is a bastard and i guess because the person has been um was a vic was a circuit was a was a consequence of some you know white foreign guy coming into japan back in the day and essentially what it seems like is raping the mum and then obviously gave given birth to a mixed race baby and obviously with blue eyes and for some reason in that period of in time in japan if a kid had you know white features such as the eyes and different type of face and eye color shape eye color color sorry eye shape and stuff you'd get kind of teased you get ostracized you'd look like as a devil so they basically ostracized and you know um the kid from when the kid was young and then when they grew up they kind of you know this you know had a lot of hatred in their heart because the mother died also because of the blue eyed stuff and all the malarkey and then basically the entire series follows the blue eyed samurai as they try to slowly kind of enact revenge on all the people that kind of you know did them wrong when they were growing up and it's a really amazing story i think so personally i really enjoyed it there's some interesting twists here and there that i won't really reveal that you're going to probably check out if you do end up watching it but honestly the fight scenes are so worth it the fight scenes alone will make this series entirely worth it to check out it's a really fun fun show i've enjoyed every aspect of it and um i'm assuming there'll be a season two because it kind of ended on a bit of a cliffhanger um there was you know a bit of a cliffhanger i'm not gonna obviously reveal and spoil that but um if you're looking for something to watch again i recommend you check out blue eye samurai available now on the old netflix blue eye samurai available now on the old netflix another thing to mention which i just finished now actually the first season it's called scavengers rain um being a bit of a sci-fi nut myself i think one of the best depictions um obviously of uh of i think space travel and you know just the harsh realities of it and how destructive it can be and how you know difficult it can be on people and their relationships and whatever it may be i think in modern years have definitely been interstellar and then i'd say scavengers rain this animation did a really good job in terms of detailing just how you know miserable and difficult it would be of a situation if you ended up on a planet that was inhabited by all these crazy weird creatures that you weren't really used to all this amazing strange vegetation that you wouldn't don't know if it's going to be you know beneficial to you or if it's going to kill you it's an incredible 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 series so basically what it what what it features is there's a i think it's a scavenger ship basically that goes to different planets and scavengers essentially picks up scraps whatever it may be and then takes them to planets that basically need them and i guess one scavenger ship unfortunately crash lands on a planet that's that's kind of you know covered with all this vegetation and frame forest and these just weird creatures and shit and i guess it's a place where people don't really like to go because it's kind of you know the the environment is very unstable and unpredictable so they all crash land there and i think it's three different groups of people and they all have varying different um they all have varying successes in trying to get back to their emergency ship basically that you can kind of fly out from and it kind of follows their journey and it's kind of gut-wrenching to be fair there's a really cool aspect of it where there's this like kind of like you know companion um robot that ends up being kind of sentient as they land there and ends up kind of morphing with the you know with the with the environment that they're in there's loads of stories about the interpersonal relationships of the people there and how difficult that was to maintain but i think it did a really good job in terms of just showing i think people like myself especially who've got this you know um i guess fantasized image of what it would be like if you terraformed mars or something just how miserable it would be living on a planet or you know crash landing on a planet or trying to do anything in terms of space exploration and shit so um it kind of falls a little bit in the horror sort of realm a little bit maybe thrillery type of thing um it definitely will leave you feeling a little bit squeamish here and there but i really really enjoyed it i thought it was a really amazing series really fun and i really recommend to check it out if you haven't already it's really 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 interesting um give it a look if you can and give it a look if you can scavengers rain available now i think i don't know where it was available i think it might be hbo max or something but you know i ended up watching it on some other not so legal sites and whatnot you know how it is so um moving on i wanted to catch up as well a little bit on the football stuff i know i'm a bit late on this but um number one to catch up on was the fulham result may united and winning one nil away from home against fulham after our poor run of results 
the win was probably the most important thing. The performance itself was absolutely shocking. Um, I thought for the for the most part, I think Fulham really disappointed. No, Fulham were really disappointed from their point of view. I don't think they really had a good game plan. I think they sort of, I don't know what they were trying to do really. I think we were there for the taking. They didn't really do so. And maybe we thought Fulham were going to come out, out, out of the blocks faster. So we kind of rested on our lowers a little bit. But we were just playing very much within ourselves. Um, Again, the play was all over the place. Defending was all over the place. We got a bit lucky in the beginning. We scored a goal which might have kind of made Fulham a little bit more nervous because we scored a goal. It got chalked off for offside. But Tommy did score quite soon or quite early on in the game. That didn't work out. And again, maybe that made, made, made me a little bit nervous of kind of, you know, coming out of their shell a bit. Um, and I, obviously some of our bigger players didn't really perform as per usual. Um, you know, you, you, you're looking at the likes of the Brunos. Hoyland had a bit of a mare playing up front. Anthony probably had the worst game he's ever had playing for United. Um, the persistence and the constant reselection of Anthony as well in the team is just, you know, there's no way to kind of cut it for sure you know even if you're playing in a team full of play there's no way to know let's just say this there's no way if you play for a team you played any time a team sports you would know if there's a manager that just constantly keeps picking people who don't deserve to get picked it's gonna cause um a bad it's gonna kind of lead to a bad environment in the team locker room and shit people are not gonna be happy because essentially part of the reason why you go to training and whatever maybe you do drills practice matches is so that you can prove your worth so that you can be considered for selection for the game that's kind of how usually things work unless you're like you know a messy type where you basically just you know you're always going to play because you're basically one of the world's best players or the world's best player but most of the time training is where you kind of perform and i think for the most part it, it, it usually kind of is twofold in terms of pressure of football usually a bit of training and a bit of obviously form in the game because if you haven't been playing well in training but they bring in a sub and you score a hat trick most likely you're going to play in the next game but anthony's been stinking up the place for so long he's still got this you know um court case looming over there in brazil with the whole sexual assault thing which i'm not too sure where that kind of stands so obviously he's got stuff going on that would affect his form and that maybe that's just an excuse but even regardless of that he really shouldn't be starting game in game out he really shouldn't be he there's no business for him to be starting at all and if anything you know Eric Ten Hag should probably take him out of the limelight to kind of give him a bit of time to get himself right or whatever it may be and to sort of like stop people you know basically highlighting his poor performances which will in fact kind of you know make him feel more shit about himself which obviously won't help him get out of the situation of the funk he's currently in so that's a bit of a weird one Bruno Fernandes of course stunk up the place but ended up scoring a goal right at the end um which I'm kind of conflicted on because I personally I'm not the biggest fan of him I think he's a bit of a stat padder but in terms of actually influencing games when you're watch, watching it with your naked eye he hardly does anything but I would also prefer it if he did what he did like the moments right when he pops up and he's able to kind of deliver um, you know, with a final ball with a shot like that that ends up kind of winning the goal winning the match for us at the end that was kind of I thought a real good personification of where United are um, one rare moment of quality allowed us to kind of put away a team that we probably had no business this week beating because on the day we were basically as bad as them but i think that's basically been our saving grace over the years we probably should have ended you know seasons being much lower than what we are on the table but because we've got individuals who can effectively you know who can affect games in a big way with the moment of brilliance we would always got a get out of jail free card and i think in recent months in recent weeks you know jail, get out of jail free card has kind of come up short for us but when you know when the time matters whatever it can be like we've got some players on our team who can produce a moment of brilliance like you know Bruno fernandez did in terms of controlling the ball taking it you know you know take you know doing a little dummy and then kind of delivering it into the set you know i think it was like a side foot finish just inside the box as well so beautiful finish very well taken and again we just marked on not much more to say about that kind of game um so i was absolutely happy about that and then i guess that led on to going away from home to copenhagen which i always thought would be a tricky game because obviously we're playing them at home and they gave us a lot of problems when they came to our home also in the Champions League. But I also just thought in terms of playing these type of game Champions League, we have a temperament of a team where if we concede goals, or if we go a goal behind, I feel like a lot of the players' heads drop. But this game started off differently. We actually played really well. I think the first 20 minutes, we absolutely tore um you know Copenhagen apart we probably should have been two to three up if any you know, we should probably should have been two to three up within the first 20 we end up scoring two goals within the first 30 
but we should have been at least three goals up in the first 30 personally for me um but that didn't work out that way and then of course what ended up happening was that they ended up scoring no we ended up conceding we ended up giving a, we ended up having one person sent off in terms of Rashford uh, which obviously changed the flow of the game but I still feel like when you got sent off I think around the 42nd minute or something we could have easily held on to that 2-0 um, lead and two half time which then would have given us opportunity to kind of solidify ourselves get ourselves organized again maybe bring on an extra defender and then we could have maybe had an opportunity to hit them on a break and score that third goal which probably would have killed the game but because we didn't hold ourselves together very well before the end of the first half we end up getting Rashford sent off and then right before the end of the first half they end up scoring a goal which gave them a big lifeline heading into the second half right and then um obviously they scored a second goal <laughs> straight after and there's 2-2 heading the second time and then obviously it was everybody's game in the second half but then we got a bit of a prize we got a bit of a reprise in terms of us basically scoring um a penalty and you know the penalty was I think a little bit a little bit soft to be completely honest essentially Harry Maguire headed the ball onto the Copenhagen defender's arm and he was right in front of him I think that was a bit of a soft penalty but considering they gave we gave away a soft penalty too I think Varane or Maguire the ball kind of rolled against their arm as controlling it so I guess they had to kind of even the score and of course Bruno Fernandes steps up right and he actually delivers from the penalty spot so it's a big moment for him big moment for the game and you think from then on the manager will put together some substitutions some different tactics or formation that will help us to hang on to that basically lead and essentially park the bus until the end of the game we didn't do that we kept playing the same way we were playing before very open um, not much defensive discipline and then we ended up kind of falling asleep at the back post I think it was Diego Dallo actually's fault um, that led to the um, Le the, the Lucas Laregra Le sort of like chance or sorry goal that he scored to make it free all and then of course right at the end um, Rudy Badajari who the, the fucking commentators kept speaking about and wanking off uh, about him he eventually delivered he ends up scoring a goal a winner right at the end a very well taken half volley to be fair inside the box um, you know he didn't really have many touches but he absolutely smashed that into the box so into the roof of the net and of course you know there's an opportunity for us to come back and I feel like this was a per perfect representation of why a lot of fans aren't really sold on Eric Ten Hag and the players I think this was definitely a 50-50 responsibility I feel like the manager didn't do enough to kind of get us organised compact and kind of get us to settle down whilst we were down to 10 men because we scored two goals and we get one man sent off we should have had a lot more defensive dif dis discipline nuance experience to kind of hold on and steady the ship until half time we didn't do that then we uh, then we happened to get the lead we happened to get three two up in the second half from a lack of a penalty and he still doesn't make necessary changes to do it and the players also aren't able to kind of steady the ship so i feel like this is an equal blame situation but for me is a clear example why a lot of fans aren't really sold on Eric Ten Hag because his end game management is really bizarre like ultra ultra bizarre um i even feel like the lineup was extra extra bizarre i'm not going to lie uh playing the lineup that he did wasn't really for my liking especially the mctominay and ericsson playing as deep landed playmakers i'm not really too sure on that uh, it looks like he's already gone cold on amrabat he's already gone cold on mason mount which is absolutely incredible considering the amount of stink that he made to sign both of those players even if one was on loan um i just don't know what's going on really i think there's a lot of question marks around Ericsson hagen personally for me if you had to kind of put a gun to my head and say will he be a success at United I'm going to say no um, already the amount of you know beefs and troubles he's had with players um, you know not really know who his best side is the signings um, you know the selection policy all this sort of stuff is really kind of making me you know not really sure that he's the guy and just in general my main thing for me that's really kind of not making any sense is the in-game management and the thing that really kind of bothers me it's bothered me for a while was the moment when for the longest time, he kept playing Amrabat as a left back, right? So Amrabat comes in as a defensive midfielder that's going to be cover for Casemiro, and he keeps playing him at left back. And it's like, I know we don't have any left backs at the moment because, you know, Malassia and Shaw are injured, but surely you should just play a centre back in that position and put Amrabat in his favourite position because the midfield is a position I feel like we need the most sort of like quality cover for because we don't have a lot. I think defence we can get by with Evans and Maguire. Again, they're not the best options, but whilst, you know, Varane isn't in favour and whilst Martinez is injured, you can get away with Evans and Maguire against most teams. Probably can. But I feel like that midfield, you really need to have some quality in that middle 
middle of the park to actually get a handle on the game. And I think playing Amrabat out wide or a left back for so long and then only recently decided to change it and put Lindelof at left back and then put Amrabat's favorite position or whatever it may be has been on. But then I also don't like just a tiny thing as well, the McTominay thing. McTominay, I feel like, has never been a defensive midfielder. He's just been unlucky to be blessed with the body he has and the frame and the stature and the height he has. People just think he's a defensive midfielder, but he's clearly shown over recent weeks and even just, you know, with form in general uh, for, for Scotland and whatever, that he's definitely more of a Bruno Fernandes type player in terms of a roaming, you know, eight that kind of runs into the box, late runs and whatnot, kind of similar to maybe Frank Lampard. And that's why he kind of, you know, flourishes. And even then, he still doesn't have enough touches on the ball, right? He's still probably not of the level to play for United anyway, in general. He should probably should never be playing for United, especially if he's having, you know, like, what's it called? I think one match he had less than 15 touches on the ball, which is fucking frightening. But if you want to get the best out of him, you're playing further forward. For some reason, Eric Ten Hag plays it further forward sometimes, but it also plays the defensive midfield. It's like, for me personally, I think with McTominay, if you can't play him as an attacking midfielder, you shouldn't play him at all. That's just my personal opinion. He shouldn't play that all if he can't play attacking with forward. And the fact that we keep persisting with him in that position is a real big worry. It shows the manager doesn't really know what he's doing in terms of identifying the key, you know, the best assets of his players and then trying to make sure that he can utilise them the best to serve the team. It's all a bit all over the place, to be fair. And then again, of course, the selection process thing, you know, the persistence, so, you know, with fucking Rashford, even though he's been playing trash, the persistence with Bruno Fernandes and never dropping him is a super annoying. Um, the defence at the moment, I don't really know what's going on there. It seems like he's out of favour with Varane. He's picking Maguire and Evans and not really budging from that sort of lineup. It's odd. Whatever. All this stuff is really strange. Even the goalkeeping stuff, right? Odana hasn't really been a revelation. He hasn't really pulled up any trees. And the Turkish lad we made a big stink about signing. He hasn't really been able to play. You know, hasn't really been able to get any minutes. There's not rotation around there. It's just a bit of a strange one in general. We've got a really stubborn manager who is very delusional. Also, I think he left after the game against Copenhagen. He said, oh, there's lots of positives about the game. I was thinking to myself, bro, how can there be positives about this game? There should be none, zero. There's no positives because we had the game in our hands and we fucked it twice. Twice, you know, once when we were two up and then another one where we, we got, went three, two up with 10 men. We should have basically to be able to hold on to it. The fact that we didn't says a lot more about the management and the team than anything else. But, you know, we're in the mud. It kind of is what it is. Then moving on to an article here, here, here occurs your Sky Sports that kind of fully fleshes out some of the issues regarding Eric Ten Hag and United. I'm going to read through this currently now. It says, Manchester United lunchboxes, no carrots and take of a limbo. What's the latest at Old Trafford? Um, it says here, United's last um, latest reverse 4-3 at Copenhagen on Wednesday night, having thrown away a two-goal lead and see striker Mark Scratch was sent off severely threatens the chances of qualify for the Champions League last 16. I might be in a minority here, but I want us to get knocked out of Champions League so badly. I don't want us to play Champions League football. I don't want us to play in Europe League football. Nothing. I want us just to have the we completely free so that if Eric Ten Hag so we can see if Eric Ten Hag can actually coach these players into being a somewhat you know um cohesive footballing side because at the moment I'm still not even sure about his coaching credentials right because he's completely abandoned them because he came to United and allegedly according to him he doesn't have the right players to play the Ajax way when really and truly most players most managers have their philosophies um, you know if they can't if they don't have the players that can fit their philosophy they just get them out and get players in that can so the fact that he hasn't done that and he's basically bending to the players will is a bit strange but whatever so for me personally I'd much prefer to see what he can do with a full week of you know maybe no midweek games and shit because we're already out of the Caribbean Cup anyway as well so that might be actually a good thing so I actually don't want us to go through the Champions League especially if we have no chance of winning it anyway what's the fucking point um, it continues meanwhile United are languishing down in 8th place in Premier League after a difficult start of Premier League campaign this season and their Carabao Cup defence ended at the last 16th stage by Newcastle that is before that we even get into the ongoing takeover saga with Sir Jim Ratcliffe now set to purchase 25% Tanakh's future is clouded in uncertainty and it should be to be fair I think every manager should be have their future is always kind of counted in uncertainty unless they're winning or unless they're doing what their remit is in terms of I don't know developing the squad and playing a attractive brand of football wherever their remit is if they're not meeting it their future should be in jeopardy I feel like you know Eric Hunt came in under the remit or I guess his assertion of what United wanted was that they had to win at all cost which is why he went for all the trophies last season which you know evidently didn't work ended up blowing up in our face and burning out a lot of players and getting them injured it did result in us winning a Carabao Cup and obviously securing top four football but 
if you're not winning, if you're not kind of meeting those standards now, right? We've already lost a bunch of games. We're at the Carabao Cup. We're probably going to be at the Champions League very, very soon. Your future should be in doubt. It shouldn't just be like a trusted manager forever and everything. That's not how it works at this level of football. It should never be that way, in my personal opinion. Even if I do think he will eventually end up being a good manager, sometimes maybe he just came too soon to United. Who knows? Maybe the infrastructure isn't there for him also because, you know, you look at Ajax, you know, since he left, they've been a bit of a free fall. They haven't really been where they should be in terms of as a club, in terms of their playing style so maybe he is a decent manager but he obviously needs the infrastructure to help him but at United his future should be uncertain because it hasn't been the greatest tenure um, and obviously in my opinion it's kind of flat to deceive a little bit it continues the short term United have got a big game against Luton on Saturday after that he'll have a bit of breathing space with the national break the Luton game is a big one because Luton have been shocking this season in the Premier League but most likely we might give them a bit of a chance right I wouldn't be surprised if Luton end up winning that game so um, driving this morning I was listening to radio with some United fans calling in saying it's perhaps time for Ten Hag to leave and the fact that they've lost 9 in 17 games this season is he the man who's under pressure um, it continues um, you've got to keep things under perspective from United's point of view they have no plans to replace the manager and have also as a club in limbo because they would dismiss him if they wanted to and there's been a takeover saga over 12 months so that's the big thing that he's got in his favour because there's a current takeover going on um, your logical sensible brain tells you it's very unlikely that you, the United board will ratify or will agree to sack the manager in the midst of them you know finalising this minority takeover bid whatever it may be that's not likely to happen so it'd have to be a real catastrophe of events to get to there but even if that is the case you look at our previous coaches and how long it took them to get sacked the, the Glazers just don't you know pull the trigger straight away they obviously have a remit where if you don't win you know if you don't get top four football basically they don't really care about trophies but if you don't get top four football usually you're out of a job so that basically is the main thing so i think we're, we're probably gonna have to be you know suffer with Ayrton Hag for a while just yet he's not gonna go anywhere and if anything i also believe that he's not entirely to blame it's obviously the owners the owners are the big reason why we're in this current situation the Glazers have been one of if not the worst owners in football history and they've kind of dragged this club into the fucking mud they've dragged us into the depths of hell and unless they leave and we have a full takeover we're never going to be successful because they don't have the ability to create a sporting structure or system or you know whatever it may be to get the best out of you know elite players elite managers and so far we've had a kind of never-ending cycle of just failing failure after failure after failure since Alex Ferguson left so the only common denominator is the Glazers and I think they're the ones that are mostly to blame but obviously in this interim you just can't have managers playing you know a shit brand of football also getting shit results also being knocked out of competitions and shit and just staying in a job it doesn't work that way just because the owners are shit it doesn't work that way unfortunately um, it continues Tengar's contract elite is on pretty safe ground too Premier League managers have clauses which make it difficult for them to be dismissed his future is clouded in uncertainty but everything at Man United is clouded in uncertainty which is very very true um it continues here too much sticking on of carrot we got a picture here of Jaden sancho the Jaden sancho saga has been really uh an eye-opening one because for me it kind of represents why united will never be successful because essentially to give you a quick synopsis of it Jaden sancho um fell out with Derek van Hag, the manager because um they had a disagreement as to how much effort he was putting in in training and then he got dropped for i think a certain game and then um and then i think Derek van Hag made a comment about Jaden sancho not performing well in training and uh, in a press conference which upset Jaden sancho because it made it seem like he was unprofessional he posted a statement on his um social media denying that and of course that didn't you know sit too well with the management and then he got banished to the under 21s um until he, until he apologizes but he's refusing to apologize because he basically thinks he's got nothing to apologize for um he's been training as best as he can and the manager just has his favorites that's essentially what he's been saying he's kind of been intimating that you know anthony and maybe even rashford just get picked regardless of their form whereas you know he there's nothing he could do to ever get consideration because those guys are always gonna get picked and i think he i think he may have mentioned something about him always getting subbed first as well i'm not really too sure but he wasn't happy basically with Eric Ten Hag. and i I think at a big club or a club that actually you know cares about sport and success these things happen it is what it is but I think the club would have stepped in you know Aiton Hogg has every right to not be happy with a player if he thinks that player isn't training to his standards even you know I don't I believe both parties Jaden Sancho also has a right to fight back and say no I'm training well you just don't pick me because you have your favorites they're both within their rights to say that it's professional football it is what he's gonna be disagreements all the time I just feel like the club if we were serious they would have stepped in they would have stepped in and said hey you guys need to give it a break either this guy leaves in January and we make it very clear that he's leaving or 
you figure out a way to kind of make this work and he gets back into the team. But you can't have a player, you know, that costs us, what, 80 plus million, however much thousands he's on per month, per week, the brand he is, whatever it may be, just lounging, um, you know, um, in the flipping under 21. It doesn't make any sense. He should be playing with the team or he should be out of the club altogether and, you know, kind of clear him off the wage bill and whatnot. But the fact that the club haven't, um, stepped in to mediate between both parties says everything because Ericton Hull has been basically be left to deal with this on his own for the most part they're giving him full control of it but I feel like the club should have stepped in and decided to either sell Sancho or to make sure that he gets back into the team because they need him as an asset to basically maybe even just use him until the January transfer window and if you want to move him you can move him but just this limbo and this kind of you know weird approach to things isn't going to sit well especially when you read the reports that you know he's getting his lunch given to him in a separate box and he can't sit with all the main players it's fucking ridiculous really how far it's gotten it didn't need to get this ugly um let's read the article it says if you're someone spending more than one billion make buying a stake in may united one of the things you probably were looking for is going to be with sancho the guy was an england player when he was at dortmund he was one of the best young players in the world he was probably more than 200 grand a week and yet he's eating packed lunches he's not allowed into the first team dressing room at all because of a standoff with Ericton Hag because he won't say sorry about something that he posts on social media um i'm sure one of the things they David Bra- Brailsford and Sir Jim Ratcliffe is going to do is trying to solve the situation which has got out so out of control and needs fixing one way or the other. Either Sancho leaves in January or they'll get to have to go to them or they'll have to get them two in a room together and not their heads together to sort it out. Although also Sir Jim will have a difficult task winning over some United fans. Yet again this weekend there has been protests at Old Trafford with a nineteen fifty eight group releasing a statement this morning saying they want a full sale only and we're protesting. Which is what we need basically. We need a breath of fresh air, we need a change. The gazers have been terrible in any way, in general as fucking owners. And even if they weren't terrible as owners, we just need a change. It's been twenty plus years of their fucking, you know, um stranglehold on the club. They need to fucking go or have their helicopter crash into a mountain, one or the others. It continues. They don't um I think someone buying 25% um, of the club will solve their future. One final thing I would say on Ten Hag is people are watching the performances and asking whether the players are f- playing for him. I think there's elements of dressing room that have lost faith, but what happens at a club all over the country? The same situation has created a lot of some splits in the dressing room, and one person I was speaking to said the problem with Ten Hag is that there's been too much stick and not enough carrot. Um, he's got this reputation as being a real disciplinarian, but with modern footballers, the stick sometimes works, but you've also got to have the dangle the carrot in front of them see things from their point of view put an arm around their shoulder maybe he needs to work on those things i don't think that's true i i think Ericton hug has kind of been fucked by the owners i don't think that's true i think you can get away with being a disciplinarian that is very much stick centric right or stick forward right um in, in terms of that you know approach with players but what you need is that you need owners and the board and the club to back you all the way in your decision so you'll do a thing like what arteta did with Aubameyang and a few other players where if they're not kind of up to scratch or if they've got too much of an outside influence in a dressing room you get rid of them so that you can kind of re-establish your authority that's what you need to do and I feel like unfortunately for Ayrton Hag he never had that opportunity he wanted to get rid of a bunch of players I think on his list of players there was like six or seven of them in the, beginning of, in the summer who were essentially on the chopping block and I think it even included Sancho and Martial and none of them left except for Fred and Fred the only reason why he left because he actually pushed for the deal for him to go to I think Basiktas or Galatasaray or one of the others and he pushed for that deal himself because he went to play he went to play football week in week out and for the most part from what I've seen online he's you know he's playing pretty decently over there way better than Matt man but then fucking Mason Mount is anyway and probably Amrabat so I think the club fucked Ericsson Hag in that they didn't give him the ability to get rid of the players who maybe have a little bit too much influence on the dressing room and get the players in that he can get into back them by the moment what I've also seen which is a big issue he hasn't been able to connect with the players out there who are obviously overrated and think way too highly of themselves anyway and probably need to leave the club ASAP and but then he's also it feels like falling out of the players he signed right the likes of the mounts the likes of the amrabats the likes of the varans it feels like he hasn't really connected even even casemiro it feels like he's somehow managed to fall out with those guys so i'm not sure what's going on i'm not sure if this is just a you know a rebellion from the players because of the treatment they've seen of Sancho if it's because in general they're all up their asses I'm not really too sure what's going on but he's got a real big job on his hands and the problem with Ayrton Hag the pressure is mounting because we're not we know it's one thing to not play good football but we're also not getting the results so the results aren't even saving him and with this minority state coming in um, usually in most companies if you know you get a bit of investment or whatever it may be they usually want to have some say so in the infrastructure of the club and the personnel so it's very likely 
that Elton Hag would be out of a job anyway. Regardless if he does well or not, they're going to want to have their own man in. But the fact that he's doing so poorly, it's going to put pressure on him because he's going to know they're going to want their own man in ASAP. So, you know, everybody's kind of livelihood is on a chopping block at the moment. Even the likes of John Murto, the Darren Fletchers, the Richard Arnolds, all these fucking guys who have been leeching off United for years and years and years doing absolutely jack shit. They're all kind of going to be you know, under fire very, very soon if that surgery record gets rectified or if the, you know, Qatar bit later on kind of goes through, who knows? But so far, it's not looking good for United. We are absolutely in the MUD. And then last thing I want to mention was this conversation or this kind of stream or this kind of, you know, press conference, sorry, courtesy of May United with Ericton Hag uh, before the Luton game, which really infuriated me because, again, another example as to why we're in the mud. It says here, Marcus Rashford, Ericton Hag says he's not happy with United's form, uh, the forward's form, sorry, but he says he will find his goal soon. So a clear rejection, no, a cl- an acknowledgement of Rashford's poor form but also no desire to kind of change him and bring somebody else in or drop him all together just to kind of fresh up the squad. It's just, let's just persist with playing Rashford even when he's not playing well because he happens to be one of our better players. But then again, like I said, what that ends up doing, it creates a bad atmosphere in the dressing room because players automatically know it doesn't matter how well they play in training. They're never ever going to play because the players that do get to play their position is somewhat solidified forever and ever. And I absolutely hate that personally. But let's continue. It says here, Ericton Hogg um, says both he and Marcus Rashford are not happy with the Man United's form this season. Rashford has scored 30 goals in competition last season, has just scored once in the start, since the start of the season, um, with United enduring their worst start to the campaign since 1974. Ericton Hogg, the record breaker, um, after nine defeats in the 17 games. Going into Saturday's home game against Luton, Rashford has the worst negative expected goal differential out of any any Premier League player in the season demonstrated a 26 year old wasteful in front of goal um the England international was also sent off in the first half against Copenhagen and a quote I think he's not happy we are not happy we have expectations he has expectations of himself at this moment he's not in the best form but I know he'll be back and I know when the team is playing better he'll play better he'll score goals I'm confident of that and I don't know it's just a little bit too much praise for someone that hasn't done much you know like it doesn't need to be this praise for it could just be a little bit neutral to give that maybe the player the inclination to kind of you know kick up the arse and also maybe give the player on the sidelines uh, kind of nod that hey the spaces are open before when you can play it just feels a little bit too doting to me that's the one reason I go you know I kind of not like it it's that this season he'll improve his score goals he's totally in the team he's tot- he's totally in the team and aware of everything he'll be back on track so um, that can happen very quickly sometimes you need only one game I'm sure that he'll get there um, United to go into the home game newly promoted Luton having lost three out of their last four but Ten Hag is adamant that his side can respond we are very disappointed Pointed to lose the game, any game, but finally it's about the end result. It's always about a process, thinking about a process and managing the process. That's the only thing I focus on. We often prove that we can, like in recent wins against Fulham and Brentford, overcome big. Again, like the way he talks, like he's not a very charismatic person, kind of speaks like a robot, and also he's incredibly delusional. Like, you know, like our performances haven't been great. We haven't played well since probably that first half in the Carabao Cup against fucking Crystal Palace. We've been shocking the, throughout the majority of the season and maybe the latter end of last season. So this whole, you know, just be positive for positive sake approach is really fucking insulting. I'm not going to lie. Um, but yeah, um, that's where we are currently with United. Ayrton Hag is going to persist with Rashford. He's basically going to persist with him until his fucking legs fall off. You know what I mean? There's no way he's going to play any other player apart from Rashford apart from that. And that's been a really disappointing part. But I remember a lot of Ajax fans on social media saying this when Ayrton Hag was signed. Like, be careful of this guy because he's somebody that has his favorites and he doesn't really waver from them you know i mean he trusts them wholeheartedly especially considering the job that rashford did for you know Ayrton hog last season scoring 30 goals he's got so much good grace with Ayrton hog that is really you know he has to do something spectacularly wrong to ever get demoted completely and even the nightclub stuff right uh against fulham allegedly you know he basically got dropped but he didn't really make it official because he went out to China White after <laughs> we got beat at Man City. So clearly there's some issues there going on behind the scenes, but, you know, they're trying to keep it closed doors because it's Rashford and stuff, so it's just a bit annoying. But hey, 
that's the situation we're in now when it comes to United. That's the situation we're in now when it comes to United. Moving so, on from that, I quickly wanted to mention um the recent collection for Bottega Veneta for the result 2020-24. And for me, this is an example. This is a clear illustration that Matteo Blasi definitely was the secret source and maybe the team that he worked with over there at Bottega Veneta when Daniel Lee was there. Because since you know Daniel Lee's uh, breakup with Bottega Veneta for varying reasons some people are going to say it's a racist incident some people are saying it didn't happen who knows but regardless you know at the height of his kind of pomp Daniel Lee kind of leaves Bottega Veneta under a cloud of uncertainty and um, he then goes on to join Burberry and it feels like to me that he hasn't been able to recreate that magic of those early seasons at Bottega Veneta at Burberry but Daniel Lee, sorry, but um, Matteo Blasi has definitely been able to re recreate it. So clearly it shows like to me that Daniel Lee wasn't as great as a designer they made out to be. He relied a lot on the team. And once that team sort of split or left, because I think there was a story I read in the New York Times on this pod about Matteo Blasi basically saying that he fell out with Daniel Lee before he ended, his, before his tenure over there ended. So that also could explain why there was a dip in quality, especially if you remember some of the collections they presented in Detroit. The one they did in Berghain was really, really bad um, and definitely wasn't anything like their you know first couple of ones that they did that kind of made the name for Matteo Blasi and put him back on the map so clearly for me it feels like we can see that Matteo Blasi at Bottega Veneta is definitely showing us that he was the guy all along he was kind of like you know the genius behind the genius um that basically been able to present with being able to present so I've got the result collection here on the screen um some of my favorite things here are definitely some of these bags I've got this bag here that basically looks like a sweater that's been tied up together um you've got some really good amazing amazing dresses here some really nice suiting and tailoring the bag and accessories are really some of the best bits and bobs I've seen from them a lot some of the casting and you know styling has been great I think I think this look here number nine was a look that was featured by asap rocky i think he recently wore that um for like a press thing um because i think there's a there's a tracksuit look here also so they're doing something different interesting they're doing this thing where like i think they featured um rocky there's a picture of asap rocky um driving this really amazing vintage i think mercedes and he's wearing one of the looks in this kind of in this collection and it was done many many weeks before so clearly it's part of the rollout and then most recently he also did a shoot or he did some like paparazzi thing where he was jogging around, you know, I don't know, somewhere in Hollywood Boulevard being chased by paparazzi and he was wearing essentially like a head to toe Bottega Veneta outfit. And at the time I thought it was strange. Like, why is he jogging in that sort of area? And then also he had these grills on. It's like, who jogs with their grills on? It's a bit strange. So it makes sense that it was all part of a promo thing. You know, for ASAP Rocky, it's a bit odd because I feel like he's way more talented of an artist to be doing that. He should be, you know, creating great music and shit and putting on great shows and videos and whatnot. But clearly that isn't probably his passion anymore. But it's a bit sad to see him running around doing those kind of fake stunts and shit. But hey, it is what it is. Going back to the show, some of the denim looks from, you know, Matteo Blasi, Bottega Veneta, I've always been a big fan of. I really do like this. Some of the big long trench coats here look number 13. The books boots, sorry, on look number 14 look amazing. As does a cheetah print dress on look number 15. Uh, my favorite look definitely in terms of casual wear would definitely be my um, look number 18 here with the, what would you call that, shadow? Shadow plano, shadow shadow flannel, sorry, that looks like it's been made in a, like sort of like a mohair type material, which is a really interesting design. So I'm not too sure if this has been printed or if that's been weaved in you know like because it's basically a mohair jumper that's been made to look like a flannel shirt and you've also got a pair of jeans here which i'm not too sure if the jeans are because Matteo blood is really just a thing with the jeans he kind of you know he'll make it look like a jean but it actually looks like but it actually feels like leather or vice versa so i'm interested to see if that's actually the case but that actually looks phenomenal i love everything about it as obviously some of the suiting is obviously very very well done um the color oh this is another look rocky also wore i think he was out with like, rihanna going to to dinner somewhere and you had this look head to toe so definitely it's just an interesting way to roll out your designs right um you have them featured um weeks beforehand in these sort of like candid paparazzi type shots maybe similar to what was going on with fucking you know maybe it's an inspiration taken from the um you know the in the golden era paparazzi when Victoria Beckham and Posh Bison running around the streets of the world and shit maybe that's part of it who really knows but I love the pink shade that bag this dress really well done I think Dua Lipa wore this dress actually it's also recently I might see a picture of Dua Lipa wearing it um this oversized um 
you know um cable knit jumper is so 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 nice i love how it fits on the model and shit the bags look really great the color green i'm really liking as well these olive green colors um nice long trench coat this sweater here with the snake motif design looks really cool it kind of reminds you of something that you'd see maybe jonathan anderson um at luebe or maybe his namesake label do it seems like very very jonathan anderson maybe acne type coded i really like the look of that also um that big trench coat looks great i like the size of the label inside the jacket i'm not going to lie um you've got a chambray shirt here with a western shirt on top um and you've got this excellent sort of like long socks i think or shoes with this look with this with this um with this um snake design at the front which are really fun and cool i like that as i do like this suit the double breasted suit here with the brown boots and the overcoat on top looks amazing as does this print that also features on the bag this kind of you know what is it brown and green um you know um basket case design i think you're gonna call it maybe a weaver which is sure but i love the color there as well i do love on this fur faux coat and yeah great dresses great color combinations great styling casting is amazing accessories are fucking booming and again another example that mateo blasi might have been the guy you know the whole time look look at this one here this on the right this denim suit this denim look is so good as is this one here with this relaxed shit um relaxed shape um shirt. no this is like an overshirt it looks like right with these two big pockets on the front um it looks like it's i don't know if it's a felt kind of design or felt material sorry because the collar is really standing up on 10 and the shape looks amazing or maybe it's just i don't know if it's been stiffened a bit what well, that that look there was amazing i think look number 43 i love that and then i think this is the look that rocky was wearing when he's running around the streets it's this look number 46 and allegedly i think they said this tracksuit that looks like a regular tracksuit is actually made of leather i think they said that actually it looks like a regular mall gray sort of like tracksuit that's actually made of leather um this overcoat looks really cool shirt skirt designs great bag there um this is the look actually that rocky wore i think when he was when he had that mercedes i think this is the one um with this orange coat and this amazing suit on the inside and i love this coat this kind of reminds me again there's a, there's a phoebe vilo coat that recently released that kind of looks similar to this kind of plyo pile plush furry number there on look number 54 and we've got a few others here again just great stuff man like Mateo Blige is definitely that guy we can't say anything about that and again that great cable knit jumper in this different sort of color blocking as well looks really great as does this shirt which kind of reminds me of the heady days of that Prada shirt that everyone was wearing right I love this type of design of a shirt actually looks really really cool so big up Mateo Blasi all of it looks fantastic I'm sure it's going to do great when it eventually does drop on the stores and yeah I'd wear every single piece of this like I even love the label but take a Vanetta with this um, kind of overstitched label on the back looks absolutely fantastic at some of the details as you can see as well look absolutely brilliant so yeah big up Mateo Blasi loved and enjoyed everything about that collection and for me a good return to form because like I said before I mentioned I think the the time that I sort of like discovered Bottega Veneta was probably around fall 2019 that was around the time that they made the lug boot that fall 2019 ready ready collection was the lug boot was the best ones and then I think it kind of fell off around here maybe around here 20 to result 2021 they started to get really shit so i think all of these from like spring 2021 pre-fall 2021 fall 2021 were all if i'm not mistaken they felt like they were designed by daniel lee primarily and then obviously when Matteo blasi made the comeback um i felt like he's basically restored the brand back to some level of prominence since he's kind of stepped back into the fold so it's been great to see really in that regard so um, more power to Matteo blasi definitely a talented guy definitely a talented guy cannot deny on that one um next we're going to feature um the updated news regarding Kylie Jenner's new brand. Um, this is an article here for courtesy of Vogue Business that kind of speaks on it. It's the title is it's very personal as her new brand starts to drop. Kylie Jenner um, on why Kai has her full attention. You just obviously see a picture here I featured before talking about this really great leather um, trench coat and these really good heels that she's got in there. Um, let's read the article. It says Kylie Jenner comes to call. It's the day before her brand Kai delivers a debut shop collection number 001 and it also happens to be Halloween. So she even a little bit spooked. I'm very nervous, she says, but I'm also very excited. By the time this um, my micro interview is posted, a debut 12 piece micro offer co designed by Berlin label Namila. 
um, that Namilia, sorry, should be available in Kai's e-store. Um, for now, though, Jenna and a 25 team, 25 strong team has its pre registration intel with which to gauge the appetite. There's been a strong level of interest, she says. Lots of engagement on all socials is greater than I could have imagined. It's been a week since Kai's um, existence has been revealed on Wall Street Journal. Um, even before the launch, the newspaper named Kai the winner of the brand's category of innovator of the year, which is absolutely insane, to be honest. Just launching a brand the other day and you get an award for it. It's peak nepotism, but anyway, we continue um peak privilege and nepotism but you continue um yeah just before just because our following on instagram and tiktok is approaching half a billion people doesn't mean that jenna isn't engaging in the day-to-day -day grind i want people to know how completely involved i am in this i also i love when people say this sort of stuff like like no we we're, we're never gonna believe you right so you might also just do the work anyway no one's ever gonna believe that kai jenna is out here kind of you know drawing um designs for her collection or sitting down pattern cutting or you know uh making samples going to the factory for production manufacture doing you know r d like we don't believe it we're never going to believe it so why even talk about it just do the work and over time if it gets proven that you actually do the thing the rumors will come out the story will come out everyone will believe you after the fact but trying to you know it's i guess youtubers do it a lot as well when they're doing like collab projects they'll be like oh i've been working on this for so long with this team it's like bruh we were never going to believe this unless we saw the evidence of it so just keep it to yourself drop the product hope people buy it yeah you know i mean there's no need to, to lie here um it continues from original co <laughs> lols from original concept to designing or co-designing if we're working with other designers from picking fabrics colors i've been in every fitting room yeah right i'm the creative director of the brand and marketing there's not an instagram post or video that has been personally that hasn't been personally edited by me um there hasn't been an instagram post that i haven't posted myself i do creative all the shoots i've worked really hard for it i put my love into it and i can't wait for people to experience the clothes it's very personal um it doesn't feel very personal it? that's that's the problem really to it. It, it all this personal stuff and you see it and it's kind of i wouldn't say it's bland or basic but for what it's worth given the amount of options women have these days in terms of shopping right you look at the fast fashion sort of like spit you know like shitty stuff like sheen and you know whatever else it may be and then you look at the other brands the kind of micro brands of these influencers and these kind of instagram brands online and other brands that set up and i think they all kind of do this job very well in terms of offering that kind of quality of garment just above a sheen but also much cheaper than like a designer brand for instance they kind of fill that void very well and i feel like i've seen these type of designs from other brands before and the odd thing for me is that i'm wondering what it is about her in particular the, that family where although they wear very fabulous crazy designs and you know fashion and shit why are they intent on dressing us normies like npcs i can't really figure it out like why do they want us to dress like you know in monotone colors and shit right looking all boring and sad right and whatever it may be but then when they step out they're dressed head to toe to the nines in whatever crazy amazing garments that they have so and the other thing that's odd too because i think i mentioned we, we already saw that kylie obviously made a big effort to attend loads of paris fashion week shows so definitely it felt like there was a concerted effort to maybe position her more in that sort of field in terms of you know you know steering away from the street where hip hop -y side of things right going away from the black people and turning more to the whites um aesthetically and you would have assumed it would just be something else that she was offering and it wouldn't be this basic shit and again i'm just confused as to why we get this and they get to wear like you know strapparelli strapparelli sorry right and whatever else garments that they're wearing and we get to fucking have this sort of stuff like i wonder what that is all about maybe it's them maybe it's them recognizing that the majority of their fan base is never going to be able to afford what they're wearing right dolce gabbana um you know um what you call it um chrome hearts whatever else that they're wearing maybe this is their way their way of kind of quote unquote thanking the fans by giving them some poor people clothes but i just don't understand it um i feel like this picture is hilarious of kylie sitting on the floor trying to style the shoot um it's, it, it, it's giving instagram stylist right in terms of hey here's me fixing the collar on the model while i take a picture and shit automatically get stylist but hey you gotta start somewhere and then you've got the other collection i think so the first one was done in what in black and then i guess there's other shapes in blue but they look very familiar to the yeezy stuff that he did with gap that's the funny thing about it right like it all looks very yeezy ish um especially some of the jackets and stuff um and you know i, I wonder what he has to say about this because especially there's one particular coat that i've seen her wearing 
that looks very much like the easy thing he done for Gap, the one without the buttons and shit. Um, so I'll be curious to see what he actually thinks of that sort of stuff. But yeah, um, I don't know. It's not very impressive to me. That feels like a little bit like it's not necessary. I don't really. It also kind of looks like that other brand that existed that was all in blue. If you remember that one, I forgot the name of it. It was a bit, I think they had all their basics in kind of blue. And I think they might have been associated with Yeezy also. Um, I think it's called Entire Studios or something like that. They were around, not sure what happened to them. Maybe they folded um, in with Kai. Who knows? That might be the case. But overall, not really that impressed. It looks kind of basic to me. Um, maybe that's the whole point of it. But I don't really see why it basically needs to exist. That's my basic premise of it. But let's go back to the article. Um, she says, um, well, I didn't care what anyone said. I think there's a lot of power in that. And I'm definitely channeling my King Kylie energy this year. So his starting point is the drop with zero one channels, what Kylie Jenner calls the time when I was growing into myself. I'm always experimenting with my style. I'm always switching it up. That's why it's important for us to make this drop really different. I think people will be surprised to see drop two and how different it is from drop one. Is it really that different though? You just swap the lever for the for the what you call it whatever that material is right i don't think it's really that different is it really that's drop one and then drop two is all of the other shit i don't really think it's that different it's kind of just the same shit it's all you know monochrome um very tightly fitting leggings and shit i don't know the shapes aren't really that different really uh, maybe maybe i guess there's leggings there's coats there's gloves here who knows but i don't really feel like it's that different let me just double check this collection again see maybe i missed something here um so that's drop one we don't have drop two do we actually we don't can we refresh that maybe drop two is released already is it released i'm not yeah as well as future collaboration she will eventually drop what she calls my independently designed core kai line so she's going to start off with collaborations with various different collaborators and people that she thinks are iconic and then later on down the line there'll be a core line of stuff that'll be designed in-house i guess so basically take and steal from people and then do your own thing later i love it um whether acne studios or prada or um jenna threw herself into the runway circuit this autumn she says that in addition to forging so many relationships with industry on her tour the experience gave her so much more appreciation and love for the fashion world every time i go to paris oh sorry so much of my appreciation and love for the fashion world and how fast and fun it is um every time i go to paris amazing things happen i love the world and i'm excited to be a part of it there's no question that whichever emerging designers Jenna might elect to partner with in the future they will also receive a high quantifiable value um these designers are amazing i'm also a fan and the way that i've been looking um is that i'm grateful that to work with them and be a part of this especially in Amelia to collaborate with me on a brand that hasn't even launched yet as you can see there you can see some stuff courtesy of them bloody blah 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 around the same time she stopped posting on tumblr in 2016 Jennifer and this, okay cool we don't need all that history lessons but yeah it's there it exists um again I'm not really too sure why it exists personally it seems like a bit of a waste of time to be completely honest I'm not really too sure what this is actually adding to the conversation it feels like it's gonna probably end up kind of you know fizzling out very very soon or maybe not maybe it'll catch wind people will really be into it but I think these shapes are kind of a bit tired um and a bit uninspired i'm not really too sure if, if people actually need this um in the grand scheme of things but in terms of pricing maybe that might be the thing that might get people because a lot of the stuff isn't that expensive is it? it's like 110 for the mini dress that you see there the leggings are 63 pounds um that amazing coat that she's wearing a trench that sold out that was only 215 the cropped um hoodie jacket was 130 so it's, it's fairly okay in terms of pricing so maybe that's why it's actually going to work the price it might actually make it you know make it make it make sense um going forward but so far i've not really seen anything that's really that eye-opening that would warrant people kind of you know you know cracking open their wallets and making it kind of rain for this sort of stuff it just kind of looks a little bit whatever um okay this is shop well, drop number two i found it here um who's collaboration with this is um in collaboration oh it is done with entire studios okay cool it is an entire studios thing so entire studios um was um absorbed by kai and we've got here crop jackets we've got puffer coats we've got cargo pants we've got cat suits um puffer jackets again so we've got the same puffer jackets in this off-white bone color and then it's also bluey iconic entire studios color and also black okay interesting so yeah let's see how it does going forward but again i'm not really that impressed to be fair and again i'm really curious as to know why they want to dress in Dolce gabbana but then they want the public to dress like npcs i wonder why that is the case i really do do wonder because so far i haven't found out a valuable or interesting answer to that question just yet personally and i'm really not too sure why that is the case but hey what do i know 
moving on from here we have um this post courtesy of fold my favorite club here in london who it looks like at the moment they're currently struggling um basically addressing everything that's been going on at the moment in gaza and what position and what stance to currently have they put out a post originally that um, i think they might have deleted actually i think it's the one i've got here on courtesy of my image um of my imgur and unfortunately this post has been deleted but it was basically their statement and it got like over 300 comments or something and people are going crazy in the comments and for the most part it essentially said that they, they were calling for a ceasefire they basically acknowledged that there were losses of life on both sides and you know it's abhorrent to see and essentially a ceasefire might be the best way to kind of resolve the situation for both parties involved you know especially considering how much blood has been spilled but maybe the verbiage and stuff wasn't really the best and obviously with the ramping up of the attack from Israel and essentially what people are now basically claiming to be um genocide that is basically happening there in palestine and um, especially some of the images that we're seeing online and stuff has been super super heartbreaking and it's impossible if you don't have a heart to kind of see the humanity or the loss of life that's going on and not kind of sympathize with the palestinian people especially when you're seeing the contrasting images of people on the beaches in tel aviv acting as if like nothing's happening right which it isn't because they're not really affected by it but clearly um this is a very like one-sided it's a very uneven the impacts in terms of who it's actually affecting so maybe people are seeing that as a problem problem um and you can read some of the comments here courtesy of the original post and um, that they put up um somebody replied in the in the comments and said love that you deleted my comment back there again to say that you haven't mentioned israel by name it's not enough what is stopping you from saying that israel aided by the u.s is causing the genocide um fold saying here as a reply as we've explicitly said in our statement we can and will remove comments that contain any level of harassment our team are part of the community like everybody else any other feedback we encourage you to email us so they're basically saying hey if you want to have an open debate and kind of you know tear apart our statement do so but don't go after our staff i guess maybe people are finding out who works at fold and DMing them not really too sure or just the comments are being too vile i'm not really too sure what the case is but if it was me i think there is no good way to to kind of you know represent your force within a little post on ig you're never going to really appease anybody because the zionists are going to come out and lambast you if you're sympathizing sympathizing quote unquote with hamas like they always kind of paint out and the, the people that are pro-palestine are definitely going to have an issue with you if you say both parties are in the wrong so you can't appease both parties so you're going to have to just make as much of a centrist comment as you can and then kind of live with the consequences of it and let people go off on the comments let them just you know argue amongst themselves debate you know terry type of jam whatever it may be but you can't really get too bothered or too annoyed if they pick apart your statement it kind of just is the nature of the situation because of the loss of life because of how emotional it is um because of how devastating it is um it how sensitive it is to most people out there especially if you're from that part of the country or just you have any sense of humanity anyway you're definitely gonna feel um you know triggered by some of these comments people are making so i definitely understand why but i just feel like folks just leave it alone and just kind of hope for the best um another reply here says try being openly queer in palestine yikes number one says it's both sad and funny to see a queer gay lesbian trans friendly techno club standing up for people who throw members of the community off roofs in gaza another one says not a word on the other side on the 1500 dead israeli 242 still kidnap babies and kids and adults and then i guess they deleted that post originally one because i guess it had like 300 last comments since i last read it and unfortunately i didn't take a screenshot of it so i can't actually see everything but then they posted a new one recently that says the following it says the loss of life is devastating and ongoing bloodshed in gaza must stop um we stand in solidarity with those targeted and join the cause of the immediate ceasefire to prevent more deaths please sign a petition of the uk government site link in the bio all the profits from yesterday's unfold will be donated to uh, medicine san fronteras doctors without borders to support our ongoing efforts to provide aid that's a pretty nice statement they put out there i guess maybe the other one was a bit too wordy um and let's see what the comments are saying there regarding that actual reply how about you talk about releasing the hostages before the seventh ceasefire with hamas another one we're done taking a stand when you didn't have to what other take a time when you didn't have to the person says it's extremely sad to read many of the comments of this post see how the same division that we see in today's society is also present within the techno community stop shouting at each other whatever you believe you must be able to feel empathy for every human life that is lost or suffering for an israeli mother who lost her children in a terrorist attack as much as for every person taking bloodshed in gaza the priority right now is the ceasefire and allowing humanitarian aid into Gaza now bravo fold for miss getting this bit right at supporting MSF what do I, let's see what the replies here on this and that actual comment 
Most clubbers don't want their dance spaces politicized. There's no need for nightclubs to be political. As people from all backgrounds dance there, they should stick to music. This is probably my take, you know. I'm not going to lie. I think you can't appease anybody anyway in these situations. I think, no, here's what happens. If you're going to have a political stance, because I think a lot of these spaces, they're having issues because they came out super hard um, in terms of backing Ukraine. When that was, an easy, that was an easy one to sort of like call because the bad guy was always going to be Russia. And, you know, when the first images and stuff that we were seeing from Ukraine, it was very evident to see who the aggressor was, right? Who the victim was. But considering the long history um, of conflict that's been going on in Gaza and in Palestine with Israel and the ongoing conversation or the be a war and genocide and bloodshed that's been spilled, um, you know, in terms of the occupation and whatnot, there's always going to be a lot of differing opinions on who's right or wrong. So I guess if you want do those with political stances, what I feel like has happened is that you just have to just say what you want to say and then just let it be. You can't then try to control the conversation, deleting stuff, taking down posts, you know, trying to clap back. It's just not going to work. Just say what you want to say. Have your stance, whether you're pro-Russian, whether you're pro-Ukrainian, whether you're pro-Israeli, whether you're pro-Palestine, whatever it may be, you have to just say your stance and leave it. But people obviously don't like the blowback and I'm assuming... You know, if you've got a big account and you're getting loads of notifications on your stuff, you're getting all these death threats in your DMs, it probably can be hard to deal with. But I think that's the nature of being political in this era that we're in now. It's a very um, fraught, you know, situation, very emotional. Everybody's on tender hooks. It just is what it is. So I feel like the only way to deal with it is to probably be apolitical as a club space use it as a platform where everybody can ascribe whatever you know everyone can kind of use your platform to amplify whatever political stance that they want right so if they want to dj in behind your booth wearing a palestinian shirt or an israeli shirt they can do so but you don't try and go out there and do any sort of stances and shit that's the way it should be really so that you allow either side of the argument within within reason to have their say but then you also completely stay out of it and you focus on what you you can focus on if you want to do you know the stuff that they did in terms of you know lending the fucking profits from unfold to doctors without borders that's amazing but i think the only way to really deal with it especially considering considering how you know um, how fucking political and how tense it is out there it just to be completely apolitical and not be involved at all in the slightest even though people say you know techno music is you know inherently political that's debatable really to be honest because for the most part what they mean is a completely different era than what we're in now at the moment, right? No one really stands for anything nowadays. No one really has any kind of moral principle, no, no moral compass, no principles. Um, they don't have any backbone, really. And most of the time, we're all in it for the fun. We're mostly in it to queue up for the toilets, to go do our little bumps, to take our little pills on the dance floor, have a dance, maybe get off with somebody in the dark room and go home. There is nothing inherently political about the spaces we're in for the most part. If anything, the political nature of it is the fact that you could go in there and for the most part... Um, depending on the party you don't you know you, you're in a space where no one's going to judge you for your you know sexual orientation your color um you know your religion whatever it may be that's probably the the most it kind of gets to and that's maybe more of a societal thing but everything else you know clubs don't stand for jack shit really to be honest um they barely stand up for the fucking clubbers and the fucking djs let alone you know p political issues you know socio-political socio-political issues um you know it's just not going to be a thing anyway um let's see another comment here a person says stick to music techno raving is heavily political yeah, people will say that um directly controverse so that directly um contravenes the needs and wishes of the ruling class that is exactly the reason why as you say people from all backgrounds can dance there is absolutely need for a club to claim to be an artist-led community-driven space for the queer community space to be political um you don't get to defend feminism trans gay rights etc without being on the side of all the oppressed yeah but that's the thing though isn't it in 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 every in each war in all wars like basically there's always going to be a, a, a part there's always going to be people on each side that are going to feel like they're oppressed it just depends on who you identify but i guess nowadays people just don't like upsetting people that's basically the main crux of it it seems like right people don't really want to upset anybody but i think the nature of politics you're not always going to accept somebody so you have to you have to be okay of you have to be okay with upsetting people and then just stand on your shit that's all you have to do really um another one says oh let's continue with the guys with the guys um comment here because uh, he actually fleshed it out really well even i disagreed with him i think he fleshed it out really well he says 
you don't get to defend feminism trans gay etc rights without being on the side of all the press um veteran israeli feminist hannah saffron said how can you ask for freedom for yourself if you don't ask for other people that's very true another one says uh turn it into being liberal so many fence sitters have outed themselves recently and they wouldn't consider anything but some dull performatism as best you def demand spaces like this they suit your knees seriously why do you come here so the fence sitting is not true I, I don't think it's fence sitting some people just don't want to get involved because it's, it's it's a pretty it's not the most easiest subject to get involved with in terms of having a nuanced opinion on you're not gonna you know sometimes you're maybe just not that interested in terms of getting involved in it because it doesn't really affect you in any way shape or form and maybe especially considering how you know tense it is out there you just feel like you're probably not going to say anything that's going to really make any really difference so i get why some people don't really want to say nothing i really do understand it um let's continue on with other people here let's go past this because they're kind of arguing with themselves free gaza free palestine another says save life yes also israeli lives all those music lovers who went to the celebrate love and music and were butchered to death and kidnapped in hamas gaza is not only one hurting where's your mention of those people shame on you you know i've been actually surprised by by this whole thing i've been actually surprised how many people in the dance music community are number one jewish or have some sort of israeli background because there's been a lot of people especially djs who have been kind of getting lambasted um and being kind of labeled zionist because they've been obviously uh, maybe pointing up some posts that have been maybe pro-israeli more so and i've been really surprised to see a lot of people connected with dance music um come from that region of the world which is really interesting isn't it? just as an observation um it continues love it says that was a unreal thank you another palestinian flag so it seems like on social media for the most part a lot of people are mostly siding um with the palestinians um for the most part right and they're probably identifying a lot with the horrors that are going on over there more so than maybe the losses of life or the people in israel who have suffered um 1260 people were slaughtered in the music festival not a word of solidarity no word about releasing 240 hostages we are praying for the lives of all the innocent from both sides and that one says well done fold i see another post here and then we'll continue on this is palestine again palestine flags thank you another says a uh, blitz club take notes um told people repeating the same thing about hostages and hamas you don't really care that much about human life if it was your mother taken you would really be defending the hellfire raining down in the city of gaza if hamas were embedded in your country your city would be saying um that it's justifiable to blow up towns where was your hatred for hamas during the years of netanyahu who supported them where was your care for humanity and morality when palestinians were being killed abused and stripped of their freedom every day you just want to win the information war another person says you show solidarity with those targeted then you are showing solidarity with hamas that is murderous terrorist organization the reason civilians are killed in gaza is 100 percent hamas responsibility that ah, come on now that's a bit that's a bit crazy um hamas attacked israel knowing israel will respond hams operates from civilian centers knowing israel will not attack them hamas kills palestinians trying to move to south again this is this is definitely given former IDF soldier. Palestinians tried to move to South, save themselves when being warned um, by IDF. Hamas still holds more than 200 captain kidnapped Israelis, and the moment they send them back to Gaza, we will get all that is needed. Again, so a very different approaches for everybody here. Um, you know, again, pray for healing from you know from the outside looking in. That's mostly where you can pray for. The ceasefire is probably the best option in the situation. But I just think when it comes to clubs, it's just difficult. You know, because again, you represent so many different people from different walks of life it's hard to really um represent all people when these sort of conflicts happen or when these sort of wars or atrocities happen so the best bit you can do is if you're not gonna if you're gonna be conf if you're gonna be sensitive about how you respond the best thing to do is basically just stay out of it and just provide a platform where people can come and you know slap whatever message that they want to slap on your club like that probably is the way to go about things don't censor their post and their t-shirts and their flyers and shit let them do what they want to do and then you kind of stay out of it so you basically um act as a platform the same way that x and instagram is right where you can basically post more well, to some degree anyway because some platforms are you know deleting some posts um depending on what side of the war that you fall on but in general that's probably the best way to go about doing these type of things i think going forward but um again um congrats to fall to at least trying to do something and put a statement out there but i think in general they should have just left it with the original one and let it rock how it rocked um but you know i, I can assume their mentions must have been going nuts so i definitely get why they wanted to kind of delete that and start again because that first post was definitely very very tense 
Moving on from something else kind of tense in dance music world, we've got this story here, which is heartbreaking, courtesy of RA. It's a Detroit artist, Super Cold Wicked, accuses Omar S of assault over unpaid royalties. And this kind of broke my heart, I'm not going to lie, because I've been a big fan of Omar S ever since I started DJing in like the early 2000s. He was sort of like my number one go-to person when it comes to like productions and shit. I can't think of another person that saw maybe Motor City Drum Club, Motor City Drum Ensemble, who then changed his name to MCDE, um, or david pusilo whatever his name is um storm um what you call it um storm queen is it storm queen what's what's it called what's his name again is it storm queen what's his flipping name again stream queen oh oh my god i can't believe i forgot his name um but anyway production wise there's a few people who i'm kind of what my go-to in terms of records i would always play when i would be playing out and on my s would be one of them too many names to you know these tracks are mentioned but this instance is definitely kind of solid his image in my head because jesus christ um let's read the article it says Detroit artist Super Cold Wicked, this lady here, accused Omar S, this guy there, of assault. Over the weekend, Super Cold Wicked, real name Morgan Hudson, posted on X and Instagram about the legends that took place in Detroit venue Parameter Sound. And I've got the actual post here, right, on November the 4th so it says here where is it there's one so super cold wiki posted this on her um instagram platform right and it says the following um omar s is a violent abuser um last night i confronted omar s um uh, at Parameter Sound about an, an over 10k in royalties and sales that had been owed to me for over a year for the What's Good for the Goose record and many more. He responded with fuck you bitch and proceeded to physically assault me including smashing a glass onto my head. It took three men to pull this grown man off of me while he pulled my hair. This was done in public with no concern of who saw and many did. I'm in shock still processing and taking um, the necessary legal steps. I would like to thank Dre, the owner of Parameter Sound, and others for protecting me during this assault. I am proud that I advocated for myself as a woman in this industry while being disturbed, um, that I am the subject of another story of a man in power abusing the woman for demanding what is rightfully hers. Omar S is a threat to the community, which is really, really, really fucking tragic, especially when you think of all the other kind of, you know, douchebags from that area of the world who have unfortunately um, done similar things. You know, I think of people like Derek May, and obviously um the past with eric Murillo and whatnot we obviously isn't from there but you know what i mean who've kind of have a very bad reputation in the industry and i think the unfortunate thing about this is that this is something that i've kind of heard from a while back um what being a thing of like you know from people within the industry saying yeah oh my ass behind the scenes is a bit of a piece of shit but i guess people put up with this sort of stuff in general in all sort of industries when you're incredibly talented right when you're really good at what you do you kind of get away with murder and i feel like the 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 unfortunate part of that sort of thing it's understandable why people do let people who are talented get away with stuff but the unfortunate thing is that if you do, if they're not checked it can lead to these situations it can lead to a situation where someone ends up getting actually hurt and obviously he's gone through his life i feel like completely being unchecked because he's on my ass and then he had to get to this point where he physically assaulted a woman in the pack nightclub and now suddenly the kind of conversation around him is, is changing but as you can see from the pictures um she's posting a picture of herself selfie with some plus on her face you can see some scratches and some ridges of blood it looks like a dent and a ding in her forehead her shirt has been ripped there's a hole in the side there's some blood here on the top of her shirt there's not a lot of wounds i don't think i can see here but it just looks like a lot of scuffs and bumps from obviously being grabbed and swung around places so you know you don't need to see a bullet hole in her body to believe that she definitely got into some sort of level of physical altercation which is obviously isn't on if you're if you're going up to somebody who you've worked with and saying hey you owe me 10k for unpaid for royalties and shit and other work i've done you don't expect to leave that conversation with you know blood on the side of your face top of your head holes in your top and whatever it may be so even though it doesn't look like she's been stabbed it still isn't a good sign because she's a girl and that guy is a grown man so it's never ever ever going to be appropriate level of action to show somebody especially if they're requesting you to give you their money and shit um it continues here let's read the article a few hours later parameter sound issued a statement on instagram with a caption we stand with morgan the venue called the allegation sorry the alleged um altercation between the two reprehensible disgusting and unacceptable moving forward they'll cut ties over my s and his record label and have banned smith from the venue so that's a good thing right because i feel like i said before one of the things that's disappointed me the most about some of these abuser stories um as much as i 
will you know the blame needs to be laid solely at the feet of the abuser i feel like we need to be grown-ups enough to realize that unfortunately the world we live in is always going to be bad and good and evil and i feel like evil people and monsters will always exist but the responsibility we have as kind of you know good people quote unquote is to try our best to call it out and to point it out when it's happening and not kind of turn a blind eye that's our responsibility because they're always going to live amongst us but i feel like in the industries like you know dance music for instance people like to turn a blind eye to abuse a lot because it serves their bottom line in that their mortgage gets paid because of this abuser their kids are being able to go to private school because of this abuser they can pay their fucking car note they can make sure their wife kind of you know doesn't have to work or whatever it may be they can go on fancy trips all because of the abuser and they can kind of turn a blind eye to it, especially when you're considering the dance music scene is a very even though it's a very you know it makes a lot of money it's still a bit of a niche scene so even if you're somebody that's abusing people in that sort of industry you can quote unquote get away with it more than maybe your conventional kind of like you know edm maybe other genre or maybe just generic normie type of stuff you can kind of get away with a lot more and the issue is um you can do that to a level and then after a while people end up getting actually hurt whether it's like you know getting assaulted getting raped unfortunately people dying that's the that's the real harsh realities of it and i think we saw a lot of it during that whole harvey weinstein thing right one of the really sad things about it was obviously harvey was a monster and deserved everything he got but the really sad thing about it was in a documentary there was you know basically people saying that hey it was an open secret in the industry everybody knew this guy was a bad guy to the point where i think there was one bit that really broke my heart where it was like one woman was propositioned by eric sorry by eric um by um what you call it harvey weinstein to go to his hotel room to give him a quote-unquote massage and she turned down his advances and then when he asked her hey have you got a friend she recommended one of her friends so she turns down the advances of abuse but then puts her friend in line to get abused it's like come on bro and i think that happens a lot in dance music scene right like where maybe hey somebody maybe you know maybe you feel uncomfortable with a dj or you feel uncomfortable with a label manager or you feel uncomfortable with agency and instead of calling that bullshit behavior out um you don't keep it yourself but then you let somebody else take that job without warning them and then they get abuse and then you know you kind of just are able to kind of advance with your career without turning back um to kind of check if they're okay that's really abhorrent so it really is a responsibility of whatever this dance music community is because it doesn't really exist right the dance music community isn't a thing but if it is a thing what it should be trying to crack down clamp down on is this sort of stuff it shouldn't be you know they're arguing with people in the comments about fucking blends and you know fucking um you know beat matching and shit it should be it should be calling out abusers and identifying them and kicking them out of scene because we don't need this especially you know i guess in my kind of naive world we're trying to create our own little escape from the real world right when we're in dance music spaces and the last thing you want is to repeat the same issues that you have in the quote unquote real world and dance music scene. you want to try to eradicate as much as possible now we're never going to get to a point of being a safe space because like i said i think fundamentally you know nightlife just the way it is the you know the premise of it being out at night after 9 p.m as our parents always say nothing ever good happens so i think it's impossible to have any semblance of a night of a safe space but if we can design something that is close enough to it we should take the chance and opportunity to do so and if it means us calling out certain type of behaviors to get that shit out we should do so um it continues um uh, following the alleged incident several current and former um of his record label artists including fully um full body during durag john fm and jmt have released public statements condemning Omice's behaviors. High Tech, who was associated with both artists, has also publicly sided with um, Super Cold Wicked. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's a bit here where I think John FM actually mentioned that Omar S actually deleted him. I think he removed all his records from his record stop or something like that. So he said that he's fine in there. I'm not going to be, I guess, it's good riddance i forgot where he posted it maybe it was on his twitter i might have seen it john fm and again he's a really good artist as well so um he said here in a statement i become aware of the incident um and that ensued last night and i'm vehemently against it and all violence against women so full stop i want to be clear that i do not stand with abusers i make music to empower people in all backgrounds that being said i can no longer create new work with omar's label as said incident has shed light on his behaviors i can only hope that our community can find healing and peace along this journey and that they enact um the work necessary to um, prevent incidents like this from happening in the future so that's what he said there and let me see if i can actually find his um let me see if i can actually find his uh twitter actually where he mentioned that um oh my it's actually took him off let's see if i can find it here bear with me a second yeah there we go as well so i think he actually posted this recently on his um x account he actually said here about Omar S taking all these records I think off of 
the record label site or something let me see if i can get up on this loading bear with me a second here yeah it says um it's come to my attention that omar s has removed all music featuring me on his label from his streaming platforms honestly wouldn't have it any other way love you all be safe and stick up for yourself so clearly um omar s isn't liking that people are backing this girl and kind of backing up her account of what happened and he's duly taking action in terms of punishing them for not having his back which is absolutely insane to say the least but let's actually see what he actually said about the whole incident um he actually replied as well and posted his post which is incredibly pathetic to be completely honest um let's see what he posted on his instagram um he says oh my yes, this is his account right he posted a picture of himself with some lumps and bumps in his head and then him fully clothed going into an MRI, MRI machine, right? Which is hilarious because if you've been into one, you'd know they usually don't let you go in like that, especially with your legs crossed, with trainers on, with his pockets full. It just looks weird. Anyway, whatever. This whole charade is really, really dumb. But um, there's a picture here of lumps of a lump on his head, which should be quite embarrassing to be fair, right? You tried to physically assault a girl and then you left with worse injuries than her, really? That should be, you shouldn't be bragging about that really, to be honest. But hey, what can we do? His caption says, as an artist who knows the unfairness in the industry, I've always tried to be fair and honest. If someone believes that I owe them something, I have always been open about talking about it. If that, <laughs> that's definitely scammer language, isn't it? If I owe them something, I'm interested in having a conversation. There's no conversation, bro. If you owe me 10K, I'm also going to do that to your head. You know, I might do worse than that to your head. And I'm not even a violent person, but you know what I mean? If you owe me 10K for the work that I've done, especially somebody, especially in, in music or in this type of work where everything's done by invoice is always late anyway. When it's artist to artist, it must just burn a little bit more, in it? Because you should know, you know the pain of what it is like to put through an invoice and have to wait fucking a million years for the agency to pay you or the club to pay you. Just do me right, do me a solid and give me the money. I don't want to have a conversation. We're not going out for a coffee. We're not linking for a drink. When I'm not inviting, don't come, I don't want to come to your hotel room. Just give me the money or you'll get left with fucking Cardi B knots in your head. Um, it continues. If that doesn't work, I'll refer them to my lawyer, Todd Russell Perkins. What a bitch, man. Honestly, what a bitch. You work with somebody D and like a collaborator, like a fellow artist appear and then, you know, it goes left and then you refer them to your lawyer. Yeah. Okay, cool. I truly believe that as a fellow artist, I have always tried to do the right thing by those who I have pleasure to work with. Yeah, you, 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 you wish you did. As for last night, again, all this is cope, right? So, so no, nothing, just this pure cope in the beginning. As for last night, a vicious attack by another woman artist. I have very little words. <laughs> he's crying like a Karen he's complaining that a girl beat him up so he, it, by the sounds of it it looks like he tried to put hands on her um, it worked to a certain extent but then she also left a mark on him right she definitely made sure she left you know she made she basically made sure that he knew he was in a fight right she, he didn't leave completely unscathed which again says a lot about that lady um, I have very little words as a husband and a father of a young woman oh, I hate this narrative, right? That men who have daughters or something have a really deep understanding of <laughs> of the female, the woman's psyche. They would never hurt a lady ever because they have sisters and mothers and daughters. It's like, bruh, if like some of the worst people in history had come from very stable families with a mum and a dad, with maybe a bunch of sisters with daughters, right? GBK, that Golden Bridge killer, was didn't he have all girls and he was out here slaughtering women and shit and the decapitating them and mutilating them and shit come on man let's be real um i am offended and hurt by the lies and salacious attacks on my character to be scrutinized and called names is one thing and to suffer the physical abuse by a super cool wicked is another look how he put her name like the end bit wicked in caps oh my ace is such a bitch in it <laughs> he's such a fucking bitch um but and i mean that in the most offensive way possible he's a hundred percent bitch but for her to say that i attacked her uh, is pure utter fabrication how can it be utter fabrication when the club the club where their attack happened says it happened parameter sound said it happened there's video footage i'm assuming probably cctv from the from the place that will show that it happened so I don't know. Maybe he's maybe he's got another account of it. I'm not too sure, but so far the clubs is back is back in Super Cool Wicked. Super Cool Wicked has kind of offered a succinct, you know, blow for blow for what actually happened. And for the most part, Omesa's reply has been mostly cope. But anyway, it continues. I'm calling on the video surveillance. Wow, he wants the video surveillance to be put out and the witnesses who saw this to tell the story i will do my part and let my medical records along with my evidence week medical records he's gonna be posting fucking blood work and other bits and bobs in the hospital to show that he was the one that actually got that doesn't prove anything that doesn't prove you're in a tussle that girl's alleging that she went up to you and 
and requested that you give her her 10k that she's rightfully owed you then responded in some way by being rude or throwing back an insult you guys get into a scuffle and you end up far worse position because you want to share medical records you had to go to the hospital like you know i mean that like, this girl put you in the hospital bro like that's pretty embarrassing um you know you should be hitting women in the first place but if you're going to touch one and then she ends up beating your ass that's really embarrassing he says um, what's this person say this person in the comments says i would have your lawyer send an emergency notice to the venue to preserve all evidence she's saying you attacked her first and that has been the angle of ra took because if you are being honest you have the right to sue the shit out of her i really didn't have to give her a side of exposure even though it was clearly available to them um they took a small excerpt of your post while the post of all of hers um that's the thing though if it happened the way it happened and he says it happened the way it happened he's got a case he could easily sue ra the girl everything and probably win but i think he doesn't have a case they're both he's trying to he's trying to like um you know call her bluff essentially but you know there's there's probably gonna be witnesses there cctv there so it's gonna be an easy one to prove either way but again considering the stuff i've heard about omar s in a scene and stuff from like you know second third fourth sixth hand accounts and shit this lines up do you know what i mean he people say he's a bit of a piece of shit um in general and hard to work with and just a little bit annoying um and shit um and whatever it may be so maybe this kind of lines up to it remind me of far and calf sending strength so sorry about this one person says <coughs> i hate when people post things in social media but only state half the story um they don't say the part that they had an incident that you always been stand-up person to try to twist a story in revelation but isn't he twisting the story too i don't understand this it's very strange isn't it in the dance music industry we have these people who go out their way to defend artists on these sort of occasions and again you don't know either party we don't know either party right we don't know either party i don't know the person um we don't know lms we don't know super cool wicked but considering the evidence that's available so far and considering again it was in a nightclub the nightclub themselves have backed up the girl side of things i think it's without reason to say that most likely Omar S did what was what was happening. Maybe this lady is living out the portion that she beat the guy's ass. Cool, that's fair. But I think the initial conversation of like, "Hey, where's my 10k?" and then they getting into a scuff where I can believe. Um, maybe again, you know, I can believe a scenario where where's my 10k? He says something that she doesn't like. She spits at him and then he hits her, and then they get to a scuffle. But then she ends up leaving it with lumps and bumps. I can believe that, but still the initial interaction started from where's my 10k you don't need to say anything rude back you need to hit the person you need to do anything you just need to you know be able to give them a time when they can receive their money and the fact that he didn't is really kind of a, a red flag in my opinion but yeah all these fanboys coming up and sticking up to people is odd to be honest especially considering the evidence that's available uh, this person says they don't say well, you've always been a stand-up person again judging how somebody acts with you as another man based on how they act with, with the you know in defense of how they've been accused of acting with other women is insane to be completely honest um no one should be physically assaulted whether male or female if you can't come correct don't expect support from anyone we got you yuck what the fuck stay strong alex um i never believe it if they post social media but don't call law enforcement that's stupid as well come on man like in this situation what's going to happen I you know unless you just want to press charges because she i guess in this case you just want your money you want to be you know away from the guy and kind of don't want to speak to him ever again the whole law enforcement thing is another false herring as well in this regard another one says wishing you a speedy recovery from a woman it looks like there god damn in total shock about this wishing you a speedy recovery another one says love heart stay strong what the fuck you work together very sad to med uh, meditation turn to violence stay strong alex i'm very sorry to see this wow bro so much support wow it's really disappointing the facts will appear in goodwill. I'm speedy recovery for you. Another one says, hey man, it's absolutely uncalled for behavior. I'm deeply sorry for you. I have been suggested this. This crap has gone out of control. This trend of female, this trend, there's a trend of female aggression. I've not seen that. Where have you seen a trend of female aggression? Maybe there's a trend, maybe there's a trend of like false allegations. And even that's not a trend really, to be honest, but aggression. You've seen women going around like trying to beat up dudes. Where have you seen that? Um, okay uh on some manipulation on social media no one should be putting hands on anyone including a woman but you still should be showing restraint and maybe i'm the only person that kind of i feel like there's very small amount of situations and circumstances that would justify a man putting their hands on a woman but i feel like in this interaction especially when you're the person that owes the person money it's it's your obligation or it's in your you know it's the incentive is on you to rectify the situation 
you maybe have to defuse it whatever you have to do you have to you have to do it because you're the one that owes them the money you're the one that's causing the issues so if it, if the person does come to you with fucking you know coming on to you at level 10 it's your responsibility to lower it whether they're being violent whatever you need to defuse that situation until maybe it gets to a certain point maybe you have to kind of defend yourself but from what it sounds like it sounds like he snapped pretty quickly there was no really calming down um thank you brother for taking the high road the high road you know <laughs> that's a look at the high road to me my friend um she would have made it a lot worse for you and given you equal rights and left cool so let's see some of her comments actually i want to see what some of her replies are saying uh who's omar because he ain't welcome nowhere he should have never feel comfortable outside no more um not hide not holding men like this accountable is a public um health crisis we all know them too often um, we let shit like this slide and don't call it for what it is you are doing the lord's work this ain't it another one says i'm so sorry megan take advantage of uh, exploited and then abused by an artist under your wing is disgusting i hate this i love you too many detroit music men benefit from our silence thank you for the reminder that it's over there you deserve so much more i wonder why in detroit specifically people are very afraid of calling out these abusers and these pieces of shit i wonder what it is about that detroit scene that see people seem reluctant to really call shit out because it seems like it's a it's a prevalent issue it goes on everywhere everyone kind of suffers from it everyone suffers the effects of it everyone knows a story but they don't really like to say it aloud or something i wonder what what it is why are they scared about these geriatric men are gonna do to them right like what are these guys gonna do to you really and truly like for real like like come on man like these guys are all losers for the most part um so sorry you have to happen to you that's lakuti big up lakuti um enough is enough selling lots of love not even surprised the sheer bro code that enables men like him many of us to go skate free is why shit like this keeps on happening thank you for speaking up constant world of silencing deleting all the music now will be amplifying especially since you're from detroit ash lauren says shaken to the core I'm so sorry it happened to you completely unacceptable he's been held accountable and that person says yeah you'll never do another event here we're gonna make sure of it I'm glad you're okay let me know if you need anything so sorry this happened to you uh, this is horrific and absolutely appalling stand with you uh, another person says sure really shocking I'm sorry it happened to you we should always stand violence against women physical and financial sending fi f financial violence what the fuck is that what owing someone money is financial violence okay fair enough to be fair if you owe me if you owe me money it's always violent so i get that right if like again in the industry with especially with the prevalence of invoices like there is something really evil and sinister about another fellow artist withholding payment from you in it 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 just it just hurts a lot more because you know the struggle you know how hard it is out here and here you are fucking popping bottles you know fucking tongue wrestling white chicks on the dance floor right finger banging asian ladies in the toilet and grinding on the sisters on the dance floor while i don't have my money all right um this is a line that should never be crossed um, never ever lay hands on others just wishing you the best so i guess either side of the argument have different points of view about what's happened again judging from what i've seen so far and the stuff that i've heard um oh my s did that shit <laughs> according to me again allegedly i'm not too sure i'm just a random guy from london talking out my ass but if you had to ask me a law of probability whether or not he did that i think he did that shit as 50 cent would say so solidarity goes out there to super cool wicked keep your head up keep your head up moving on from that one we just have to mention this issue regarding whore um the amazing or once amazing berlin um dj live streaming platform that kind of rose to prominence during the pandemic has been facing some backlash regarding um their stance on the stuff that's going on right now in gaza and just generally how they basically you know it seems like silencing um certain voices especially considering the stances that they have here it says here whore issues a statement following online backlash and calls for a boycott um the platform whore is accused of censoring pro-palestinian clothing worn by two performers so a burning streaming platform whore has responded to criticism online including calls for boycotting to remove archive sets whore's latest statement has um, was sent yesterday november the 5th to all artists in the database which is not true um according to a few people i've, I've, I've been checking out on social media um, it seems like not everybody got it i'm not too sure if they did that on purpose <laughs> or if it's just like a glitch on their side of things with their um send grid or whatever it is mail chip that they use 
but it seems like not everybody got it and many artists who have played there three or four times said they've never received the email so i'm not too sure if they purposely hid it or sent it to a small group of people hoping that no one read it i'm not really too sure but obviously people did and they put it out there um according to hall no small number of artists missing and we are doing the best i can to collect the artists in the email which resident advisor has seen um Hors, two israeli founders again that's what i've said before i find it really interesting how many people from israel are involved in the dance music scene don't you find that very interesting especially within like what you call quote quote powerful positions um it really is quite interesting to see like such a small area of the world has such a a big kind of like i guess influence on a lot of areas in dance music so i guess it puts them in an awkward position because obviously a lot of people out there are mostly identifying with the plight of the palestinians and if you're an israeli person there you're probably going to feel a little bit aggrieved that you've got people coming up in your platform and lambasting your country and shit i understand the side of things what's going on there but i think the issue that they have or the issue that the problem that they what they're doing wrong in my opinion is the silencing of people and telling them to remove certain pieces of clothing that shit that's out of that's completely out of line in my personal opinion if you're going to be a political platform uh, which they have been in the past you have to just allow people to say what the fuck they want to say you say what you, you want to say let people say what they want to say they kind of let the chips fall as they may but silencing people and shit is not on in my personal opinion um they said um, founders clarified a position after allegations surfaced online from two artists who said they've been asked to cancel their performance or remove clothing that showed support for Palestine. The instances took place in Copenhagen in Berlin last Friday, November third, and in Copenhagen, local artist um, instances took place in Copenhagen, Berlin. Okay, cool. So I think so. I'd assume maybe during the maybe during the marches that was happening in Berlin, maybe some maybe some of the procession went outside and protested outside the hall studio because it's pretty much on a you know a bit of a main road so that might have been what happened and obviously maybe something went down there i'm not really too sure but yeah that's really unfortunate um in copenhagen local artist t was asked to remove their scarf while later in berlin sam clark said that his set will stop midway through um due to his t-shirt which showed a palestinian flag and the word palestine written in arabic um so let's see if i can actually find the actual original statement because the original statement is really interesting to read because it kind of paints a completely different picture as to what actually happened there. Let me see if I can find it. Bear with me a second there while I kind of pull it up here. Okay, so I've managed to find a post where um, somebody on Twitter posted actually the full statement or the full response that Hall put out there that they sent to only a small group of people in their contact list. This is from an account on Twitter called Next Dimensional um, on Twitter, and they posted the following. Hall's just sent out a long email. So let me read the whole email I'm full so we can get a full scope on what their stance is and what they've said because some people have really agreed to the response. So the this is the statement Hall put out there say, and this was sent to all DJs allegedly, but you know, people are uh, alleging that they didn't receive it. Due to recent events at our studio and posts on social media, we went to reach out to you directly to clarify our petition. Yeah, that's something I realized too, by the way, before I continue. I actually checked their Instagram, they haven't updated it in a long time. Um, I was actually wondering what was going on because because this is something obviously inside baseball you have to be really kind of you have to care about this shit to know all this sort of stuff right i'm obviously a little bit in the weeds a little bit in the scene and stuff and a little bit you know neurotic when it comes to this sort of stuff but i noticed for just on the outside in that they hadn't updated a lot of their streams they didn't post too much on social media things kind of seem to be a bit quiet as the output and it kind of makes sense now and if you check the instagram i think they've turned off comments on nearly all their posts i think you have to go back to kind of maybe a few months back to see a, a post that has comments open so clearly they've had an issue um with their response to um the com the, the, you know the, the current conflict and they haven't really been able to i guess address or appease some of the concerns with the community out there so let's continue reading it we have been appalled by the events that have taken place in Palestine and Israel. Our hearts have been broken by all the innocent victims. We hope an immediate and end to violence and relief for the Palestinian people from its humanitarian crisis, as well as for the safe return of the Israeli hostages. We wholeheartedly support the right of Palestinian people to self-determination and freedom. We take our responsibility to create a safe space where artists can share their responses to the devastating events seriously. We have seen many artists using our platform to show solidarity with Palestinian people by wearing t-shirts, scarves and flags. We believe in freedom of expression and we have not and will not censor flags or peaceful slogans. It continues. However, there are symbols that for some audiences are controversial, which will not allow. And again, this is where it gets touchy because what is controversial how do you judge that that's why you have to let everything go or you let nothing go but you can't do this in between thing right this is like select this is definition of selective politicking the next uh slide here i'll show you the next bit of the email it says um 
On Friday, we had two instances where individuals wanted to demonstrate solidarity with Palestinian people, but our content moderation team felt that their items of clothing would be perceived as offensive and were calling an eradication of Israel. This is what I don't like. I don't like that they are palming off the blame to their content moderation team. Just say, as two Israeli citizens, whatever it may be, we just felt uncomfortable having that sort of stuff on our platform. You can say that, even though they're, you know, it's been alleged the two founders of Hora, two former IDF soldiers, I'm not really too sure the validity of that claim, but I think you're, you're within your right to say, as Israelis, we felt uncomfortable platforming these images that called for the eradication of our country. You can say that. Even whatever you get, and that's the thing I've realised, people are just afraid of the blowback they're going to get for the stuff that they say. You can say what you want to say, but you just have to let the other side say what they want to say to you back in reply. You can't then just like be uncomfortable, then delete comments, or then kind of close comments. It's just such a pussy way to go about things. Like, if you're going to get into the fray, if you're going to get into the frying pan, get into the frying pan. Don't just kind of dipping your toe and running away type of shit. Um, and again, the content moderation team thing is really um, lame because essentially they're, they're kind of using their employees basically as human shields when really it's their issue. Even if it isn't their issue, they should be presenting it as their issue because they're the leads and they're the founders so that's something i don't like it continues um in one instance is an artist wore a scarf with the phrase the land is ours written in arabic while in another instance is another artist wore a shirt featuring a palestinian flag superimposed over a map of israel it is never our intention to upset any of our artists but keeping our platform as respectful space is very important so of course but that isn't considering what the conflict is about and considering the nature of the debate that that falls in completely in line with what's currently going on so i don't really see why you can say these things but then you can't display them on the t-shirt it's like what like come on bro um because basically if you're if, if you're it, essentially if you're being pro if you're pro-palestine you're essentially espousing some of the beliefs that have been written on a t-shirt or this i mean that's basically what you're basically saying so i don't really see that they don't have a leg to stand on really this argument this is kind of bullshit these are just excuses we also have a load of stories in Turkey and about our platform which we want to directly address number one there have been questions about some social media posts shared by us, the founders of Hor after October the 7th. As many of you will know, we are originally from Israel, <laughs> which I didn't know. It was like, fuck, bro. Interesting. We and our families were shocked and saddened by the events on October 7th. We personally know people who have died or were kidnapped and are still missing. We deeply regret sharing posts that we did not appreciate fact check after October 7th. Okay, so this is, this is the issue they're having. They try to get involved. They try to kind of advocate for... Israeli lives, they got the facts completely wrong, they got demolished in the comments, and then they kind of ran away scared. That makes more sense what's going on now. Now I'm kind of getting it. We personally, da, 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 um, we regret the fact check after October 7th, and we're sorry that we offended anybody. We in no way support the aura um, that has been inflicted on the people of Palestine, and we have listened to. Next slide. We have listened to we have listened to uh, the, the, we listened to those who have reached out to us in the weeks since, educated ourselves in new areas and learned a lot. There was an isolated instances where an artist who was showing us so that your Palestine left the booth eight minutes before the set ended. This led our content moderation team to think there was an issue with the set, resulting in putting it on private just to check if it was a problem. When they realized that there was nothing wrong, it was immediately put back online. <sighs> come on bro you couldn't just notice like co this content moderation team how do they not realize somebody left a set eight minutes before the end aren't they there in the studio when it's been recorded or are they kind of off-site are these like are they trying to palm off the responsibility on like remote workers in the philippines or something like this is really egregious man the lack of personal accountability that they're responsible to take it is kind of gross um the content moderation team has been mentioned i feel like more times than the founders we're aware of a former vendor who listed his employment on linkedin as whore and has been sharing hateful posts this individual supported us and i was at early 2002 we only ever had two or three meetings with them unfortunately we are not aware of the political opinions and they do not represent our views or values Finally, Finally, we understand that some of you feel that hurt by the delay in us setting up our position on the matter. As a platform, we have always tried to be open and transparent. We will learn from this experience. We believe in the importance of freedom of expression, but you're not really in it. You're silencing expression, as I'll show you in another post in a minute. Um, it continues here to end it. Um, try to be open and transparent. We believe in open expression. Uh, we are looking to into training our content. <laughs> Again, content on this content moderation team is getting all the blame. Not the found the content moderation team is getting absolutely burnt here. They're getting front of, they're getting literally front under the bus. Um 
to ensure that we have uh, clear guidelines for our team and artists to follow. We would like to thank the majority of our artists who have been really respectful um, and engaging in the conversation with us over the recent weeks. We'll continue to listen and work hard to create an environment that is open, respectful. Uh, we would like to have an open dialogue with you, so please do reach out directly to us. They only want it via email. They don't want it publicly on their platform. They only want to, you to reach out to them via email, which is super sus anyway um for us to include we would like to share the thoughts and ideas of you personally forward our hope is that completely so our hope is that our community comes together at this difficult time and uh finds comfort with the values and unites us in creative collective our platform will remain open to anyone looking for an outlet to express themselves via music yeah right didn't reply to my email did you back in the day anyways um with that being said, we've got another post here, courtesy of another artist. If I can, no, this is actually the one where it's kind of depicting all the stuff that's been taken out. So this is courtesy of a user called on Twitter called Rival Alt ninety three, and they said, "Just wanted to share some screenshots that that so that we, all of you know to boycott whore." So let's actually see the post here. So the first post details um, a Instagram story shared by somebody um, called free sam clark and it says so horse stopped my set because they didn't know that my shirt says it and it says it says palestine so he's got a shirt here um i guess that's the shape of the country maybe with the palestine written here in arabic and obviously the palestinian flag superimposed into the land there and they were saying that horse stopped my set because they didn't know what it was so obviously they're censoring people telling them to just get off another one says whole told t to take off her palestine scarf um and i guess we've got a picture here that shows the palestine scarf here this is t it says um just to reference uh the person's other post earlier this was the scarf that i was wearing and i've been wearing all day they said that the scarf was fine and the flag would be fine too but the map is too controversial <sighs> come on man which i don't really understand why isn't that what this whole thing exactly that's what the whole thing is about like what this is nonsense i can't really say anything that hasn't really been already said i'm not really the victim here but damn if you stand with israel give them your land exactly <laughs> Um, another one says they've got a more post from Sam Clark here more details he says the following I just played my first set at Hall this evening in the past days I'd been aware that the owners had taken down and reinstated sets by artists that have shown visible support for Palestine right um, I wore a shirt on my stream that I bought on Solonau in Neuklund that said Palestine in Arabic I performed 20 minutes of my set before the attendant told me that their bosses instructed them to stop my set because they noticed my shirt and wanted to make sure that it had to say something um, inflammatory they told me that i had that i could have conversation with them about the shirt's meaning and start my set over again or cancel altogether which is incredibly patronizing to be completely fair and insulting and demeaning on all those other words the shirt says palestine it's interesting to me that they wouldn't know um that what it says as the israeli seems a bit basic ultimately i decided i wasn't interested in the conversation and didn't want to start my set over again i'm not really sure what to do about it now but i feel as though whole berlin needs to face the reality of unfolding in front of their faces and make a stronger stance against the genocide instead of interfering with basic gestures of solidarity stop supporting this radio until it happens exactly that's a that's the main point there it's a basic basic gesture of solidarity if you're not going to be involved in it if you're going to sit on the fence cool but then what you can do is just let your platform be a voice and a platform for people to share their own opinions and stuff that's what you should do and i think like what i'd like to see i guess it wouldn't happen but what i'd like to see if that was the case and you came on that platform as a zionist i'm like you know what i'm gonna be pro i'm gonna be pro israeli to the death and i'm gonna wear my fucking israeli um flag scarf and my israeli flag t-shirt and rep for my people fine and be okay with the comments you get back or whatever it may be but both sides you know essentially want to say what they want to say but also want to control the conversation it feels like but what you can't do as a platform is then start censoring people telling them to take off their top stopping their, their sets mid set that's really abhorrent and the fact that they the founders are you know throwing the content moderation team under the bus that says a lot about them really to be completely honest but then there's an interesting post here courtesy of another dj uh called juba who has a very interesting take and it's almost defense of whore which kind of feels a bit funny considering what's going on but let's actually read her statement here because it did cause a lot of controversy online to the point where she had to private her account because she was getting a lot of kind of you know some blowback on there essentially because she was twerking for whore so it says the following it's an 18 post right 18 tweets basically it's kind of long let's read the whole thing so whore is the next platform to become the pariah of the music scene again sometimes i look at the dog pile 
how culture of the cancellation and i wonder how sustainable this is and what we actually want to be creating music landscape to look like in the future how can we create an industry in spaces where we rightfully hold entities accountable but don't desecrate but but don't um, desecrate the ecosystems that we use whether these types of spaces radio stations or online platforms i'm all for holding platforms accountable and leveling necessary criticism and i really respect when people have genuine conviction in their decisions and truly understand why that governs their behaviors simultaneously one of the reasons i side eye this culture of online outrage and defamation is because i am convinced and i'll even go as far to say that i know that the solid percentage of people who join in don't fully believe what they're saying come on juba is, is that really your defense some some people are choking out their asses that's okay it's kind of falling off the cliff already um or haven't really interrogated narratives that are reproducing and why they're doing it side note i also think more platforms need to actually interrogate why they do things as they avoid enveloping themselves in unnecessary drama um i think people are afraid that they'll look bad if they don't follow the righteous wave or that their silence will be used against them they know that if they're still on the certain lineups that they'll be criticized and judged either publicly or private group chats then suddenly it's like this it's like shit here's another platform that i can't be associated with here's another gig that i can't play here's another bag fumbled not because i actually want this but because i don't do the right thing it will have failed the virtue signaling test but that so basically she's complaining that her bags are getting <laughs> i love the i love how unashamed this defensive this is affecting my pocket can everybody just get on please can you guys all put down the guns can you put down the missiles can you stop burning kids chopping off their heads and shit can you stop fucking bombing hospitals bombing residential areas civilians um aid workers journalists and stuff can you stop doing that so that we can all go back to playing music it reminds me of that post and i think unfortunately it was from a black girl also it was during the height no during the start of the uh, war in ukraine just as russia started to fucking launch the fucking missiles and shit and hit residential buildings i remember it was also at the time that i was actually considering going to kiev like in that same year i was going, I was going to kiev because obviously the clubs there are fucking phenomenal and it kind of happened in the same sort of i think it was around summertime right just before the summer not be too short but i remember this post going viral of this girl that was on a kiev i think it was like an expats in kiev telegram or something sincerely also she might have been the trouble to sure, but she was like oh does this mean we can't party or something like something's like that sincere post like does it mean like what's going on guys like this war does it mean the club's gonna be open on the weekend and people are like bro like they're shelling they're shelling major parts of our capital city of course the clubs are going to be closed what do you think is going to happen this feels like the same sort of thing it's like my bags have been affected can we please you know stop the war <laughs> oh this girl is amazing once again i'm actually um once again, if people actually hold convictions, I think that's great. Previously, too much bullshit was allowed to run and people acted with impunity. Platform spaces and um, etc. constitute a few... Uh? constitute of humans who make uh, mistakes and be outright problematic and such things could be called out sometimes the situations is actually beyond help more often than not i don't think it is also often um, when you have honest in real life conversations there is a space for more nuanced and moderate readings um, of what's going on online and understanding that there's a physical world where disputes don't need to be concluded with such immediate indefinite rigid effect yeah but considering the information that we have available i mean there's there's not really much debate about what's going on really in it you can sympathize with both sides of the argument but in terms of the narrative or in terms of what's actually going on there's not real much debate really in it. that's why it's going to be free palestine until the end really to be honest there's not much debate about what's actually going on You're, you can have sympathy and have you know feelings for the people in israel who have obviously been affected by this negatively but especially if you just look at the instagram stories it's, it's heartbreaking especially over the weekend you you click on the instagram story locations of certain parts of fucking gaza and shit and you just see it's been absolutely flattened and then you just click on certain parts of israel and you see people you know drinking and smoking and hanging out sunbathing on the beach and shit like completely different experiences so hey what do i know continues um there is some space for actually finding resolutions and just and not just tearing things down what also happens is that in a few years after the anger has subsided and the perpetrators no longer exist we're like ah it's actually a shame that we went down with radar what yo this girl does she know what happened with radar radio it's a shame what went down on radar radio i wish it had been handled differently or hall was actually a great platform i kind of miss it this twerking for these 
in my opinion, this is a really odd defense because Radar Radio and all these platforms, even the whore, they're not really that important. They're kind of important because no, basically, what it seems like in dance music, it seems like artists, for the most part, don't like doing the work for themselves, right? They want, like, I feel like there should be way more artists owned clubs, in my personal opinion. There should be more uh, clubs that are owned by a collective of artists where they can all play, where they basically, you know, use it as a ground to maybe test out new talent, um, to nurture new talent, uh, just to put on their own parties, do it the way that they want to do it. They should do the more of that, but they don't. Instead, they take the big fee to do the party, um, to play for an hour or two, and they kind of duck out of their private jets. But they like to go into ready-made places. They like to kind of do the whole plug-and-play thing. I want to play at your venue. You have the equipment, you do everything, and then I just plug and play. Obviously, some go the extra step and kind of have their own production, and lightning, whatever. But the most part, most DJs just rock up to a gig with headphones and a USB but they don't really want to do their own thing so i get it so that's why these platforms exist because they provide a platform for an artist to come and plug and play to boost signal boost themselves to reach a new audience and maybe potentially get more gigs right that's essentially what they're used for they don't really it's not used for anything else it's kind of used as a way to kind of you know let people know what you're about and whatever and i feel like Hall did a really good job more unique than others because at the time that they kind of came about there wasn't really a thriving i can't figure there was another station in berlin at the time i think it closed just before horse started actually i forgot what the streaming site was but there was a lot of platforms that were like berlin based that were you know showcasing a platform with a lot of teachers there like you know if you know anything about berlin you know that they take dance music very seriously there they have a prolifera right probably way too many djs for spaces so there's loads of talent there that doesn't really get any recognition so they did um, and you can say, you know, with a straight face that they were responsible for breaking a lot of artists, right? They actually gave a lot of people a chance and that actually led to them going on to get more bookings and shit. Cool. But um, the platforms aren't necessarily the most important factor. It's still the talent. So if the platform disappears and another one comes about, the talent will still always be there. Same with Boiler Room. There was a time when Boiler Room was the most important platform ever. That kind of subsided. Now Horse started. That subsided now. Now another thing will pop out. So it's not like the platforms are that important, really. You know, that's the really major thing. But that's what she's saying, right? So let's continue on. It says, and then we have vacuums in the industry where things once existed that could have been much valuable pillars of our community, but they were dismantled and never rebuilt. But then it's also hard when the platforms or our people themselves don't help to count closing themselves off by constructive criticism and don't take accountability for the act impulsively without a plan for the long term. There's also a lot of deflection of wanting to escape the heat without addressing the legitimate grievances but on the other hand the apologies are never good enough <sighs> she's saying everything isn't it she's kind of occupying both sides of the argument without really saying anything but also i just feel like mostly she's just worried that another platform that could signal booster is kind of going to go away and it's going to affect her bottom line <laughs> really and truly something new will always be created but the voids are still there no one like honestly like <laughs> this is crazy i believe that social media has many virtues um especially during the times when widespread solidarity and the mobilization of anti-oppression movements is necessary but during these times it also becomes an uneasy place where it feels like the uh, the guillotine is hanging over people's heads um and the lost uh, so at least they make a mistake and they know um sorry at least they make a mistake and i know i'm not the only person who's sick of it so obviously some of the replies here aren't really feeling her um a streaming platform created in 2011 2019 so that doesn't pay djs is not exactly an indispensable cultural institution exactly the only del power culture cancellation of note right now is one cancer people for the anti-genocide exactly and i want the media show to be pro-palestine so in fair that's that that point is not really that's null and void because i think everybody's if you're going to be pro if you're like a if you're a founder and you're from israel and stuff like it, it, it's understandable why you'd feel uncomfortable with people calling for the you know eradication of your country i understand i, I get it I get why you, that would maybe touch your balls and shit. The problem that I have is just that, you know, if you enter into that fray, you have to allow both sides of the argument. You have to be okay with the uncomfortable thing that's going to make you feel. You can say what you want to say, but they have to say what they don't want to say. But I think the first two points are straight. The other one says, yeah, what's to be saved here? The fact that they have a YouTube reach, the fact that the bathroom is iconic, they weren't paying anyone and they were using the scene to build a brand for to make money. That's the thing that's really interesting about dance music, isn't it? There's a lot of like pay for play there's a lot of people just like going to stations like that not wanting to be paid just for the exposure when i feel like really and truly 
all that work should be really put into cultivating and nurturing your own platform which people don't do enough of there's a lot of people just wanting to plug and play as opposed to building their own thing because as i've as i've noticed with kind of streaming my own dj sets on my own channel it's a slow burn there were times when i was streaming to like one person right and you get like 100 views at the end of it it can hurt your ego a bit but i feel like you're, you should always resist the temptation to not to buy views because the temptation is always there. You just Google how to buy YouTube views. There's loads of services that can you can use for very cheap to make you feel somewhat great in yourself and give the impression that you're popular when really deep down you know you're not. But I feel like if you cultivate that audience from the ground up, like from having one viewer all the way to having 100, 1,000, 10,000, whatever, that's actually how you blow and how you have a sustainable you know fan base um, that can last for a long time. And you also go out there and you actually prove your worth by selling tickets because real people actually watch your streams as opposed to faking the funk and then when you get books for places you're not selling tickets and then venues realize oh shit you bought your views because i'm sure that's something that happens in the scene i'm sure people are getting booked because you know bookers have a million and one things on their plate maybe sometimes they're lazy but i just feel like they're just so busy there's no time to always kind of you know um double check everybody that's going to play and make sure their views are legit so you're booking somebody based on their variety on social media or maybe the high view count they have on youtube and then you're like oh okay come play at our club then you notice straight away the numbers that they had on social don't represent tickets because you've sold none and then when they go and play on the night you realize oh shit they're not as popular as they say they are because the room is half empty so i'm sure that happens often than not i'm sure it does but I still think the way to cut the way to kind of counteract that is to actually build your audience off on the ground up and to not depend on the platforms. Obviously it's a nice signal boost, but to do it on your own regard, that's a really big marker. Cause I feel like I've seen like a lot of evidence of like botting of views or maybe the importance that platforms have on the reach of a video. Because you'll see a DJ do a live stream on one channel and get hundreds of thousands of views. Then they'll do an interview or another stream on another smaller channel and they'll get hundreds of views, right? So clearly there's a discrepancy there, which means that maybe your fans don't follow you everywhere because you don't really have that many fans and your views are botted or the platform is the one that's bringing you all the views you're not bringing the views to the platform kind of thing that could be a case uh, let's read another couple of replies here um okay but what um was it not them that literally cancelled sets because of the artist's views exactly we're not sure of platforms we don't need them new ones will inevitably come through if needed nobody needs to spend energy trying to make these establishments learn from their mistakes and make good on community shut it down now the whole like purpose you went to shut them down things a bit extreme um i feel like if they're gonna shut themselves down anyway based on their own views you don't need to go out there you know calling for people to kind of lose their businesses and shit um but i just feel like like i said there's too much dependency in the dance music scene to kind of just use platforms and not cultivate your own audience or to kind of you know basically grow your own platform and i think that's the best way to go about things personally especially nowadays considering the plethora of pe fucking artists out there the only way to really separate um people really is by their reach it's sad. it's not really the fairest thing but that's the only way to do it really what the person say shackley solidarity doesn't count anymore and it's toxic when it has to do with where i aspire to play he <laughs> he yeah exactly that's true or when my pockets want to be lined another one says um it had to be it had a good and successful time if anything overhyped um time to shine a light on other platforms uh eg um radar radio went down other radio stations went up exactly no real reason to support problematic platforms um and enmity replaceable in perpetuity which i agree with another one says here uh same guy has been kind of funny here uh people holding convictions and virtues as if this is some virtue signaling not them actually supporting an ongoing genocide and an apartheid state lol also the voice in this community babe this is just a dj show get a grip exactly um now this is just one easy protests are supposed to be disruptive you guys are just libs yeah so um it's fair to say the jubilee ladies um retort didn't really get a lot of support i understand her concerns i get it um but i think this isn't one of those like you know flash in the pan knee jerk cancellation things this is something affecting real people real lives have been lost real bloodshed children families just people in general dying unnecessarily so in the most brutal barbaric way possible and it's so far sh there's like no end in sight so i feel like people are in their right and so, again it's a thing that's been going on for many many years are in their right to have very strong opinions about it and to also feel very strongly when the platforms that they support don't maybe hold the same opinions as they do now should that be the way to go forward probably not but again i feel like it's on the responsibility of the platform to decide what side you're on 
and decide whether you're going to get involved in the politics side or you're not. If you're not going to get involved, let people say what they want to say. If you are going to get involved, you also have to be comfortable with people disagreeing with your position or calling you out with your shit. But it seems like people are afraid of both things. They're afraid of making a stance either way. Same with this girl. She kind of said both, she's kind of talking out both sides of her mouth, but fundamentally you can kind of get the feeling that she's just upset that a platform that she just got a, a look on, she's just probably getting started in the industry, probably starting to get her first proper real gigs and shit. And she's feeling like, oh, fuck, here we go again. Another platform kind of disappears and shit. And to be fair as well, when Horde started, there wasn't a lot of other streaming platforms out doing bits, right? Kind of everyone kind of like went cool on Boiler Room. So maybe she saw them as like the saving grace because like I said before, the good thing they did in the beginning, now not so much because, you know, recently they had um, Seth Trucks on there who's not really an underground artist, you would say. But I think when they first started, they did a really good job of platforming a lot of what you would describe actually underground DJs, people that probably didn't get a lot of gigs or airtime anywhere else, kind of were able to sort of like signal boost themselves on their platform. Obviously, most of it came because, you know, the lockdown, no one really had anywhere to go. All the people that were based in Berlin had were basically stuck there. Um, that basically was more the reason why, but still, they did it anyway, and it kind of helped. So they did play a big role, but... You know, if people decide to vote with their feet because they're not comfortable with their political position, that's okay too. That's the way it kind of should be, really, in, in all shape and way, in all ways, shapes and form. To be honest, people should always vote with their feet in places they want to support or not support. So I definitely understand that position and what's going on forward. So, in my opinion, personally, hopefully, they kind of get rectified on both sides of things. But it looks like it won't because I think a lot of people have made it magnet up on whore. I've seen people basically requesting for their sets to get taken down. I was checking their platform recently and I saw a lot of sets missing and shit. So clearly, there's been. Um, a reaction to um, how Hall's been um, acting and the stuff they've been saying and you know like I said that whole you know taking people's sets offline and stopping them midway telling them to take a piece of clothing you can't do that bro like you just can't do that so that's definitely not going to sit right with some people so I definitely understand people deciding you know what enough's enough we're not supporting them anymore I definitely understand that going forward anyways that has been the Agassino Zinger Show episode number 722 thank you so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if you've enjoyed the show you like what you've seen please make sure you smash the like button down below if you listen via the podcast app of course leave me a flipping five star review wherever you are um you can also if i'm not mistaken on the description find all the links all the stuff i've been talking about just hover over some of the subjects you'll be able to click on them and see what i was talking about and read it for yourself at your own leisure if need be and of course you shall hear the tune of the day playing under my voice right now for those of you listening to the podcast app of side of things if you're watching the youtube side I'm sorry, no tune today because I'm gonna get copyright strikes. So thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll see all you guys again very, very soon. Peace. <laughs>